We are live from City Hall. Well, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. At this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Lukura Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. I will do a roll call of council colleagues. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor uh, Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. All right, everyone is here. Adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. I'll move that the April 3rd, 2023 City Council and Public Hearing Meeting Agenda be adopted with the following changes. Uh, replacement report for item 3.1, bylaw 20435, and replacement attachment for item 3.10, bylaw 20432. Thank you. Could need a seconder? Second. Councillor Rice, right? Uh, any questions on the adoption of the agenda? Councillor Rutherford. I would like to amend the, I would like to make a motion to amend the agenda to add uh, six, 3.15 and 3.16 as first item of business. And um, what number is it? Sorry, I'm just, and 3.12 as second item of business. Okay, so 3.15, 3.16 to be the first because they're cross-referenced and there's a request to postpone, right? But I still uh, want it to be first item. Yeah. Yes, and so we can deal with that uh, if approved uh, to be first and said, then the second item will be 3.12 or 3.13. I understand that Councillor Jans has a, has a uh, family commitment that you need, you need to be at. Uh, by 1.30, so that is the reason for to uh, make that a second item. Uh, okay, so that is moved. I need a seconder. Second. Oh, yeah. Councillor uh, <laughs> Councilor Jan seconded that. Any questions to add those two items to the uh, ad adoption of the agenda? Councillor Hamilton. Um, I, I guess I'm, this is rather extraordinary in terms of procedures because ordinarily I think the message that is commonly sent is that we don't make things time specific, we don't move things forward. So I'm wondering maybe why, why moving things forward as opposed to um, then asking for it to uh, be brought forward uh, later on the agenda once we see what selections are. Okay. That is a good question, but I'm going to go to clerk to uh, give us guidance because I understand that Councillor Rutherford uh, did talk to clerk and this is the process that she's entitled to follow. 
both options would work. In some cases, you'd approve the agenda and then have following amendments um, to move items forward. You could also approve the agenda with the following amendments as proposed, or you could do it later on in the agenda after items are selected, but all are procedurally accurate. Is the question to me then about... Nope. Councillor Rutherford, does that Councillor Hamilton, does that answer your question? I, I mean, sure, I guess it's just six of one, a half dozen of the other. I just uh, would be mindful that we don't want to start to set a precedent of moving things around on the public hearing agenda because we have told people that the agenda is the agenda and it could make things really tricky for us in future. Yeah, I don't disagree, but uh, this is the procedurally accurate. Maybe I have a question. Maybe I, I can give the chair to uh, Councillor Stevenson. Can I ask that question, Councillor? Uh, Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. So my question is to the mover. Uh, why would you not prefer, why would you prefer this process to be followed instead of uh, going through the agenda as normal than bringing forward items that uh, we, that at that time we can decide to bring those forward? Yeah, I mean, I never got a real chance to introduce my motion. Yeah. So I guess I'll use this opportunity to, to do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I made a com when we had this meeting, and uh, this item was postponed in March. I was very clear on my intent because I was told by the clerk that this would be posted in the order that it was, and that I was very concerned about it being last item again. And so I made it very clear my intent to make it first item of business. Um, and so, if it's voted down, it's voted down. But I made that commitment and promise to the community and, and I, I, I feel like it, because it's within my right to do, I, I'm going to keep that commitment. That is okay. That's your introduction. So I'll maybe follow up with the question again, uh, Councillor Rutherford, why not, why can't this item be brought forward once we have approved the uh, option? Uh, uh, it, like if, of the agenda. it can, but yeah. I think that just, again, I'm mindful of uh, confusion from the public. The public doesn't know the ins and outs of our procedures, and I feel like a lot of times public hearings are very much uh, intimidating as it is to public members, and so this felt like a more clear okay. approach for the public. So you want to give them that certainty and clarity. Okay, got it. Okay, any more questions? I'll take the chair back. I see no more questions. Please vote for the. Uh, uh, there'll be the amendment to the, uh, to the adoption of the agenda. So we are voting on the amendment first. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Now please vote on the adoption of the agenda as amended. Just getting that loaded. <coughs> we have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Any protocol items? Seeing none, explanation of the public hearing process. All right. The city clerk will call out the bylaws to be dealt with. I will call out the names of the people registered to speak to each bylaw. Next, council members will select the bylaws that they wish to discuss and vote on any bylaws that have not been selected for discussion. Council will then deal with each of the bylaws that were selected for discussion and debate. For each item, administration will first provide an overview of the bylaw. Members of the public who have registered to speak will then be invited to make their presentations. Those in favor will speak first in panels, followed by those opposed in panels. 
Each person will have five minutes to make comments. The clerk will run the official timer in the council chamber. The timer lights on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes, turn yellow when there is one minute remaining, and fla flash red when the five minutes are up. If you're participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you and other panel members. For this, for this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. After comments from the public, council may ask questions of city administration. After all questions of administration have concluded, I will ask council if they wish to ask any further questions of those who presented in the response to new information that may have arisen during the public hearing. Thereafter, council may close the public hearing and debate the bylaw. If you're participating virtually, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking and refrain from using the raise hand function that creates issues of fairness and decor. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you're here with us in person, the clerk will guide you to your seat when it's your turn to speak. As Edmonton transition from provincial mask mandates and city temporary mask bylaw, we ask visitors to council chamber to be kind and respectful to each other. You may wear a mask to protect yourself and those around you, and please respect people's personal decisions around wearing masks. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's direction to evacuate. City staff will direct you to your muster point. At this time, I'll ask our city clerk, may you please call the bylaws. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.1, bylaw 20435, to close portions of road right of way at Secord? We have Chris Nicholson to answer questions only, and Yolanda Liu to answer questions only in favor. Uh, no one is in opposition. We confirm that they are online. Yes, let me get onto the screen. Here we go. I will check if uh, Chris Nicholson, are you there? Uh, Chris Nicholas is here, yeah. Okay, and Yolanda Liu. Good are morning, you? I am here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.2, bylaw 20099, to close a portion of 156th Street Southwest, Chappelle? Uh, we have Rod Hendricks to answer questions only in person, Rod, there you are. And Peter Sukalis to answer questions only in person. There you are, both are here. And no one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.3, .3, Charter Bylaw 20369 to rezone land for low density residential development, Keswick? We have Doug Vandenbrick to answer questions only joining remotely. Doug, are you there? And Om Joshi to answer questions only joining remotely. Om? Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. And no one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.4, Charter Bylaw 20429, to allow a wider range of industrial uses, Cornet Industrial? Uh, we have Emma Zerwell to answer questions only in person. There you are, Emma. And uh, Stephen Yu to answer questions only in person. Both of them are here. And no one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Items 3.5, 3.6, and 3.7 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.5, bylaw 20177, to amend the Windermere Area Structure Plan? Item 3.6, bylaw 20178, to amend the Keswick Neighborhood Structure Plan? Or item 3.7, charter bylaw 20179, to allow for low density and multi unit housing Keswick? We have Chris Nicholas. To answer questions only, joining remotely, I'll ask Nicholas again. Chris, sorry, are you there? Yes, Mr. Mayor. And Yolanda Liu, to answer questions only, joining remotely. Yolanda, are you there? Good morning. 
market and no one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.8, Charter Bylaw 20431, to allow for the development of commercial uses intended to serve the community, still water? Okay, yes, we do. Uh, Yolanda Lu, and to answer questions only, joining remotely. Good and, morning again. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Mark Bortoluzzi, to answer questions only, joining remotely. Mark, are you there? Good morning, there. Mayor Sohi. Uh, I am present. Thank you. Thank you. And no one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.9, Charter Bylaw 20430, to allow for a mix of small scale housing, Dover Court? We have Dylan Massey to answer questions only in person. There you are, Dylan. And Keegan Gorda to answer questions only in person. And Kevin Miller to answer questions only in person. Kevin is not here. Okay, so just uh, we'll cross off Kevin, Dylan, and Keegan are here joining us in person, and no one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Items 3.10 and 3.11 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.10, bylaw 20432, to amend the Central McDougal Queen Mary Park Area Redevelopment Plan? Or item 3.11, Charter Bylaw 20433, to allow for a mixed use, high density development, and a new public park, Queen Mary Park. We have Vanessa Develter to answer questions only in person. There you are. And Brian Horton to answer questions only in person. Both of them are here. No one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.12, Charter Bylaw 20384, to allow for mid-rise multi-unit housing Windsor Park? Okay, yes, we have a number of people on this item. Uh, in favor, Mark Huberman, to answer questions only in person. Mark Huberman. I am here. Good morning, everybody. Oh, you're remotely, okay. Uh, Gavin Hill, to answer questions only remotely. Good morning, I'm here. Okay. Uh, Michael Borland, joining Good morning, remotely I'm here. to speak, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Jared Kendlish, joining remotely to speak. Good morning. Okay, thank you, Jared. Marcelo Figuera, to joining remotely to speak, Marcelo. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Richie Lamb to answer questions only, joining remotely. Richie Lamb, are you there? Okay, we'll check back. James Murphy, in person. There you go, James. Uh, okay, we have a number of people from community in opposition. Uh, Eddie Du in person. There you are. Timothy Bush uh, joining in person. Karen Hughes joining in person. Uh, Lucy Bleckle, Bleckley. There you go. Thank you for joining us in person. Joe Miller. Joe Miller joining us in person. You're here. Uh, Bill Shores on behalf of Elizabeth Miller in person. No, uh, remotely, sir. Thank you. Bill is joining us remotely. Uh, Lisa Lee in person. Lisa, there you are. Uh, John Jamison in person. There you are. Uh, Rolf. Myris, in person. There you are. Greg Mansell, in person. There you are. Iona Bureau, in person. Iona Bureau, in person or remotely? No. Uh, Melanie Bureau. In person, Melanie. Oh, here you are. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah. Uh, 
Susanna Burrow, there you are. Uh, David Lynch in person, David Lynch. No. Elaine Scholes in person, there you are, Elaine. Jesse Hawkins is joining remotely. Jesse Hawkins. Yes, I am here, confirming. Thank you. John Collier in person. There you are, okay. All right. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Items 3.13, 3.14 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to item 3.13, bylaw 20423, to amend the Edgemont Neighborhood Area Structure Plan, or item 3.14, charter bylaw 20424, to allow for a variety of low density residential uses, mid rise multi unit housing, and stormwater management facilities, Edgemont. We have Rod Hendricks to answer questions only in favor in person. Yep. Peter Sulakis in, uh, uh, to answer questions only, sorry, in person. Yep. And uh, Stephen Mussel White to answer questions only in person. There you go. And no one is in opposition. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Item 3.15 and 3.16 will be dealt with together. Is there anyone to speak to items 3.15, bylaw 20404, amendment to the West Angle Area Redevelopment Plan, or item 3.16, charter bylaw 20405, to allow for a mix of small scale housing, Englewood? We have Amy Stewart to answer questions only in favor in person. There you are. Uh, we have Harpreet Singh to answer questions only in person. Harpreet is not joining us then, right? Okay. Okay. And we have a number of people from the community in opposition. Uh, Chad Oman, remotely. Oh, you're in person. Okay, Chad. Okay. Okay. And Daryl Niedermeyer, in person. Hey, Niedermeyer, in person. Yeah. Uh, Reg Kons, remotely. I'm present remotely, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nada Handus, joining remotely. Yes, good morning. Thank you. Uh, Angie Taliani, joining remotely. Angie? Okay. Uh, Kayla Ingen. Hey, Join, good morning. Joining remotely. All right, so that is it. That is done. All right, selections, colleagues. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Hi. This is Angie. Annie, I apologize. Uh, I accidentally got disconnected when you were asking about I am present online. Oh, you were there? Thank you. All right. All right, selections. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I will select 3.15 and 3.16. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Thank you, Duane. I'll select 12 and 13 then. Yeah. Uh, just 12. Charter by the Windsor, 13 is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. got it. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Rice. I would like to select 3.2 for question to administration only. 3.2? Okay, anyone else? Seeing. No, so we have selected 3.2, 3.12, and 3.15 and 3.16, which are cross-referenced. All right, we're ready to move the balance. Councillor Cartmel. 
Good morning, Mayor Sophie. I will move closure of the public hearing on items 3.1, 3.3, 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.10, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.89, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 3.10, 3.11, 3.12, 3.13, 3.14, 3.15, 3.16, 3.17, 3.18, 3.19, 3.20, 3.21, 3.22, 3.23, 3.24, 3.25, 3.26, 3.27, 3.28, 3.29, 3.30, 3.31, 3.32, 3.33, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.47, 3.48, 3.49, 3.50, 3.51, 3.52, 3.53, 3.54, 3.55, 3.56, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.34, 3.35, 3.36, 3.37, 3.38, 3.39, 3.40, 3.41, 3.42, 3.43, 3.44, 3.45, 3.46, 3.57, 3.58, 3.59, 3.60, 3.61, 3.62, 3.63, 3.64, 3.65, 3.66, 3.67, 3.68, 3.69, 3.70, 3.71, 3.72, 3.73, 3.74, 3.75, 3.76, 3.77, 3.78, 3.79, 3.80, 3.81, 3.82, 3.83, 3.84, 3.85, 3.86, 3.87, 3.88, 3.90, 3.91, 3.92, 3.93, 3.94, 3.95, 3.96, 3.97, 3.98, 3.99, 
I guess, can I ask, I, the question is more to the applicant about is that why the post, is that also a factor in the postponement or did that already come to executive? Uh, maybe we can ask the, uh, the applicant to come to the microphone, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Stewart. Uh, my client, Mr. Harpreet Singh from Amrick Land Developments, is out of the country on a personal matter, which is why we have requested the postponement. It is, has nothing to do with the uh, Shaanxi letter that you have just mentioned. So has that, come to, has that decision been made at executive already? Not that I'm aware of. I am not involved in that discussion. That is between the, um, the landowner and the city directly. What I understand, the, the request for postponement is solely because the owner cannot attend the public hearing today. That is correct. Okay. He wishes to attend okay. in person. I, I mean, I'll just, I'll make short order of it and use the rest of my time to speak of it. I, I don't think that that's a valid reason. We wouldn't do that for community. Um, they are only here to ask questions, not do a presentation anyway. We didn't have any questions last time. We had the opportunity to ask questions. Um, so I would consider that an invalid reason. Okay. I'm just speaking to it. Yeah, we'll maybe ask uh, uh, our legal counsel for opinion on that. Sure, Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to. Um, historically, we've always given deference to applicants. They bring the application on it. They have a right to withdraw it at any point. They decide uh, when they feel their application is ready to come and then, and then administration schedules it. So. The short answer is historically we've always given deference to an applicant. Okay. All right, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mayor. So just maybe one more question, question, Mr. Johnson. Because we heard from all of the speakers, uh, I, I just I want to make sure I understand. We're not essentially starting from scratch. This was a postponement. So, so everyone that has already spoken doesn't get another five minutes to speak, correct? Correct, but it is a public hearing, and I, I think there's some valid argument there that the applicant should be able to be present and participate in that, even if it is for their own insights to be gleaned from the public hearing process. Uh, but I guess my question is they, they were present at the last public hearing, had an opportunity to speak, chose not to. They, they put themselves for questions only. And I Correct. think that's the same Correct. as today. So uh, I guess for me, what I'm wondering is that if we don't end up, I, I think the question would be, if we have questions for the applicant at new information, I feel like that would be a valid reason to potentially postpone it. At the moment, there hasn't been questions. so. Is there a fairness issue? So if we if we don't end up having any questions, they're not required to answer those questions, right? I mean, councilor, I don't I don't believe it's procedurally unfair to not grant the postponement. That is within council's prerogative. And yes, at any point in the process, you could decide it does warrant a postponement. I, I, I simply state our historical practices. Absolutely, I'm yeah. just trying to think. I, I, my my feeling was that, was that since we had already started this and heard from speakers, I was feeling a little different than if this had been the first time in front of us we hadn't yet heard from anyone. Uh, understood. Okay, yeah. that's helpful, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, if we postpone again, do we need to re-advertise or we're still okay? You would be okay as long as the motion is postponed to a specific date. Okay, okay. and then, oh, actually, to the applicant. My apologies, I went back to my seat. That's okay. Um, is Mr. Singh not able to join remotely? I believe he is, um, based on time change and whatnot, um, possibly in India. So it's... Okay. So he indicated that he was not available. So I can only relay what uh, my client has passed on to me. Okay, because we do have a number of people joining remotely So I, on other matters. So um, I was just wondering what his availability was for that. Okay, okay thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. So just to our legal, um, if I understand that we have done in the past whenever there's a request to postpone uh, coming from the applicant, but do we give similar con consideration to the opponents? Uh, to the members of the public, and uh, would we postpone if a cons uh, say member of the public who made a presentation at the last meeting 
uh, were not able to attend this meeting, right? Would we give the same consideration? Mr. Mayor, that, that question is probably more to council. Um, but in the, like historically, have we? Historically, no. Historically, applicants have generally been given um, more deference. We, we have seen those in, in opposition to matters ask for postponements, and those are, have been granted as well. Um, as well, we have another matter coming shortly where that started in that forum. Okay. Um, it, it is not legally required, I want to be clear. I'm, okay. I'm simply giving you what the past practice and history has been. Okay. So it's not legally required, so there's n is, is there not following that historical precedent does not set any legal challenges or anything? No, no, it's simply an understanding that there is some level of ownership by an applicant or an owner of the land in, in requesting the rezoning in the first place that, that provides a bit of deference to council. Okay, That's got all. it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I share Councillor Rutherford's uh, observation on this, right? Because uh, we need to be fair to both applicants and to the public. If, uh, if the, historically it may not have been the case, but maybe moving forward that has to be the case. Uh, Mayor, okay. just to add to uh, that discussion around fairness, uh, all of the speakers have been made aware of the possible postponement, okay. um, just in ahead of time, so there has been awareness to that. Got it, okay. I'll take the chair back, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to, to follow up on some of Mayor Sophie's questions, uh, I guess, to, to legal, can you just uh, help me understand the the difference between um, sort of expectations for applicant versus you know public speakers when it comes to um, that deference for postponement, I guess. Sure, Councillor. So all those that registered to, to come before you and to speak on an item have an equal footing and platform. They all get their five minutes. They have a chance to be questioned by members of council. Um, they have a chance to offer clarifying questions. That's the element of this that would be lacking for the applicant. The only distinction I offer that, that we've historically looked at in the past is that there is a level of ownership of an application. They own the land. Um, they, they started this process by asking for a rezoning. So that puts them in a bit in front of the uh, front of the process to begin with. But as I state, once it is on the agenda and the agenda is adopted by council, you own that item. And so if you choose not to postpone it, that is legally permissible. I'm not at all advising contrary to that. It's just that historically there is yeah. an element of ownership. Um, yeah. They could withdraw at any point and that, yeah. would, that would force your hand on a matter, of course, yeah. but we don't see that. We just use that bit of as an analogy that there is a level of ownership. Yeah, that was gonna be my second sort of follow-up question is that they have the autonomy to make that decision at, at any time. Technically, not once you've adopted the agenda, but I would no, advise yes. against proceeding if they yeah, wish to withdraw. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Rutherford, you have more questions? I just, uh, you were previously on the. I, I do have a question. I, I just read this letter that didn't come to me from to, that went to exec, and so I do have a question. So now. just hold on, just hold on. Uh, uh, so you have questions. I'll come back to you then for a second round. Councillor Hamilton. Um, I was going to put postponement on the table. Okay. I'll move postponement. Okay, move, push, push, you're moving the request to postpone to... Uh, and I'll okay. second. Okay, that's Constable Stevenson, right? Okay. Yes. All right, so we have a motion to postpone um, and uh, questions. And uh, Constable Rutherford, now we have a motion. Probably second round is not required. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, I guess just to legal. Um, so there's an, an e a letter that was sent from this applicant to executive on March 27th, which would have been after the last public hearing and prior to this public hearing um, with an offer to gift this land if there's a sale of another land. Um, I just want to make sure that this isn't being used as sort of some sort of pawn. So I guess my question is, is there a, if we make a decision today one way or the other, does that, I guess just, is there an interplay there or would you advise that that there no decision be made on this while this other thing is happening? Do you get what I'm trying to ask? I believe so. Let me see if I can yeah. give my thoughts on it. I haven't seen such a letter um, and I would I would put to, to City Council that isn't before you at the public hearing today yeah. and we would want to keep those as two separate okay. issues. Fair. Um, maybe that is the answer, that that really should be dealt with on its own stream. Uh, rezoning this land always at the end of the day comes down to council. Do you feel that this is the appropriate 
zone and available uses for this piece of land. Ownership isn't generally on the table, actually is never on the table at public hearing. We're looking at long-term use of a piece of land. Okay. And so I would really advise you keep those two as separate issues. Okay. okay. That, that helps clarify. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Nack. Just to speak. To speak? Okay. All right. We have a motion on the floor to postpone. Okay. Now all the questions have been concluded. All right. Now to speak. Councillor Nack. Uh, uh, thanks, Mayor Sobey. Uh, yeah, I, I started to touch on this a little bit in the questions. Um, if this hadn't, if the public hearing hadn't already started, and we hadn't already had the chance to ask questions of the applicant and heard from the speakers in opposition, I would have supported this um, because I felt that that would then sort of more align with uh, some of the advice I heard from Mr. Johnson and the public hearings that we've dealt with over the years. Um, because we have heard from them and had the opportunity to ask questions, I'm comfortable with proceeding with the caveat that if I got to new information and I felt that I had a question for the applicant based off our questions of administration, I would in fact then support postponing because I wouldn't then be able to ask the applicant. But I am not sure if that is going to happen. So at the moment, I don't see any reason to postpone, but I would support one potentially after questions of admin and only if I had questions of the applicant. Otherwise, we've had the chance to speak to the, to the applicant, uh, ask questions of them. I'm comfortable with proceeding with the public hearing. Again, this is, this is unique uh, and I appreciate Mr. Johnson's flags early on, but what is unique about this is that this is not something that has not yet been before us and have not yet had folks speaking before. So that's why I view these different and why I wouldn't support at the moment uh, a postponement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Nack. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you. I you know, really um, appreciate the conversation today and I appreciate all the public speakers that have, have joined today and recognized the frustration of uh, uh, you know, the continued, continued uncertainty. I do think um, erring on the side of, of uh, procedural fairness for the applicant whose, whose lands that uh, this does apply to, I think uh, is an important one. So I'm happy to, to support the um, postponement motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Yeah. Unfortunately, I will not be supporting this postponement uh, because I think uh, we need to give same consideration for uh, for the applicant and the members of the public who might be here uh, to f speak in favor or in opposition uh, to any application. I think uh, historically we might have given that uh, more of lenient way to uh, to the developers. Uh, I think it has to be a balance. A balance has to be fair. It has to be um, in a way that. Uh, uh, everyone feels that they're being treated fairly by the, by the city and during these public hearings that they feel that uh, the, the balance is not tilted toward, toward developers, right? So that's the reason I would not be supporting this. Uh, historically, maybe things were different, uh, but we always learn and we need to do things differently, okay? That's why I would not support the postponement, okay? Uh, I will take the chair back. And I will call the vote. Mayor, so we may we just confirm the date on that postponement? We heard from the applicant they were requesting May 13th, 2023. Just want to confirm that's valid. Sorry, May 15th. That's, that's what the administration has stated as well, right? Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Thank and that'll you. be the date. All right, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is granted. Okay. Now we go to our second item on the agenda, which is, uh, uh, sorry, to the members of the public who were who are here on uh, item 3.15 and 3.16. Uh, the postpone has, postponement has been approved. So I'll be coming back to the, uh, uh, can you repeat the date again, please? 
May 15th, 2023. May 15, 2023, that item will be coming back uh, for, for council. Yeah. I know it can be frustrating, but that's the process. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now we are on to item 3.12, Charter Bylaw 20384, to law for mid rise multi unit housing, Windsor Park. This was postponed at the February 12, 21st, 2023 City Council public hearing. And uh, 3.12. All right, we'll go to administration for a presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, beside me today is uh, Andrew McClellan, who is acting senior planner, who will provide the presentation. Thank you. Good morning. This application proposes rezoning several properties in Windsor Park to allow for a mid-rise residential building through a DC2 site-specific development control provision. The building would have a range of heights from four to six stories and a maximum of 172 new dwellings. Next slide, please. The site is located on 118th Street, just north of 87th Avenue and directly across from the Windsor Park School and Community League. Several bus routes are available nearby on 87th Avenue and 119th Street, and both the University and Health Sciences LRT stations are each around a 10-minute walk away. Bike routes are directly accessible on 116th Street and 89th Avenue, and the site is about a five-minute walking distance to the University of Alberta. There is currently an 11-story mixed-use building under construction immediately to the south of the site known as Windsor Terrace. Next slide, please. Administration sought feedback from the public through a variety of ways, which included a pre-application notice through the applicant, mailed postcards, an engaged Edmonton webpage, meetings, and on-site signage. We heard from over 60 community members with concerns regarding this application. In addition, administration heard from the Windsor Park Community League and the Windsor Park Citizens Coalition Committee, whom administration met with three times in November and December 2022 to discuss their concerns, answer questions, and provide information. On this slide, we are highlighting only the three most common concerns we had, we heard. More detailed comments can be found in the What We Heard report attached to the bylaw package. We heard that multi-story buildings of this height and length should be built on main roads, not the interior of communities. The belief that increased traffic is a safety issue for students at the nearby school. And that the impact of the existing tower being built just to the south of this site needs to be determined before another large development is considered or approved. We recognize this proposal represents a substantial change from the smaller scale single detached housing that currently exists. And we understand that change is already underway with the construction of Windsor Terrace. We have worked hard to ensure our recommendation factors in the cumulative impact of both developments. Next slide, please. Administration values public input in alignment with the city's public engagement spectrum. We consult the community for advice and use the feedback to inform the planning analysis while also working with the applicant on potential revisions to address concerns that were heard. The local knowledge gained through engagement on this application led to several changes to the proposal. This included reducing the maximum height, limiting the list of allowable uses, regulating a diversity of unit sizes, adding requirements to address privacy and overlook concerns, and adjusting the building's exterior materials to better fit with the surrounding context, such as those found on the school. In addition, local knowledge about traffic patterns, particularly related to the school drop-off and pickup, led to additional details and analysis being included in the transportation impact assessment. The required public entity contributions include several infrastructure improvements to address concerns from the public about safety, particularly students going to and from Windsor Park School. Next slide, please. A direct control zone was used instead of a standard zone to address the design challenges of a long site and to allow multiple height transitions in a single building. The proposed regulations ensure a well-designed building that is sensitive and compatible to its surroundings. The site is longer than we typically see used for four to six story building. The DC2 breaks up the extended facade length in a creative way with an S-shaped building that adds dimension to the street wall along 118th Street and the rear lane. This reduces the perceived length of the building, allowing for variation in sun access and creating space for landscaping, amenity areas, and servicing while maintaining suitable setbacks. Next slide, please. The height of the building also varies from 20 meters, roughly six stories, at the south end, to 14.5 meters, or roughly four stories, at the north. This continues a transitional gradient of height away from 87th Avenue and the Windsor Terrace, decreasing towards the smaller scale buildings further north into the neighborhood. Next slide, please. 
This slide shows a comparison of the proposed DC2 with the nearest equivalent standard zone, the RA8 medium rise apartment zone shown as a blue transparent box. There are two main advantages of using a direct control zone for this site compared to the RA8 zone. First, it ensures the building's S shape and second, it regulates the variation in height. It also allows for a much larger north setback to ensure a very sensitive transition to the house next door. Writing specific regulations provides surety that this proposal is compatible with the surroundings by reducing massing and providing architectural variation. Next slide, please. The city plan locates this site on the edge of the University Garno Major Node. Major nodes are urban centers anchored by public institutions and significant employment that capitalize on excellent transit access. As such, they support the highest range of uses and density in the form of mid and high rise buildings. This application contributes to these goals by proposing a low to mid rise building with a high standard of design and an increase in density. It provides more people access to diverse, diverse housing options that are close to employment opportunities, the University of Alberta and active travel networks. Next slide, please. The proposed DC2 provision includes regulations for an underground parkade with access from the lane. This will increase the volume of all modes of transportation in the area and in particular for car trips in the lane. Daily volumes in the lane are expected to rise from 150 to 750 two-way trips. This includes trips generated from the Windsor Terrace building to the south when it is complete. To help mitigate the impacts of this, the application requires that traffic signage be installed to reinforce driver expectations and control lane intersections, that the lane be upgraded to a six meter wide commercial alley standard, and that bicycle parking is provided at an enhanced rate, and that a bicycle wash repair and maintenance station is provided. As Edmonton grows more dense and compact, it is expected that lane traffic will increase. It is important to note that this increase is a trade-off to prioritize streetscapes for people walking and rolling. Part of the trade-off can mean a change in how some lanes operate. For example, it is expected that drivers will more frequently need to pull over in order to allow others to pass. We recognize this is a change to driving patterns in some parts of the city, but is a common occurrence in the many mature neighborhoods that have narrower lanes and or have multiple apartment buildings being accessed off the lane. Next slide, please. To comply with city policy C-599, this application is required to provide a total of just over $375,000 of public amenity contributions. The applicant has chosen to satisfy this requirement through the provision of six three-bedroom dwellings designed to be attractive to families, a cash contribution towards parks, gardens, or open spaces within Windsor Park, and through transportation infrastructure enhancements for people walking and rolling in the area. Next slide, please. The transportation related contributions address input from Edmonton Public Schools and concerns from the public about safety, particularly for students going to and from the school. These include two new crosswalks, a sidewalk extension and concrete landings for student drop off and pick up on 119th Street, and a new sidewalk on the north side of 87th Avenue, including a new bus stop pad. Next slide, please. Administration supports this application because it meets the intent of the city plan for de development at the edge of a major node. It employs direct control zoning to ensure a compatible built form with sensitive transitions to its surroundings and appropriately increases density and housing diversity in the Windsor Park neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Now we will go to uh, members of the public in favor of the application. Uh, I will call your names and uh, we will panel the group and each, each, each of you will have five minutes to make your presentations. And Mark Huberman joining us remotely. Uh, good, again, good morning, uh, Mayor Sohi, members of council. I'm really here just to respond to questions only. Okay, just I questions. I have no presentation this morning. Okay, your questions only, Gavin Hill, to answer Thank questions you. only. Gavin? Morning, yes, just for questions. Thank you. And the first speaker will be then Michael Borland, joining remotely. Michael, you there? Good morning. Okay, yes, I'm again, here. second speaker will be Jared Kendallish. Jared? Good morning. Okay. And third speaker will be Marcelo Figuera, joining remotely. Good morning, yes. And Richie Lamb confirming again to answer questions only. Okay, Richie Lamb is not here. Uh, James Murphy in person to make a presentation. Okay, and he'll be num speaker number four. All right, 
Yes, James? You'll be number speaker. Speaker number four or? You want to have a different order? Yes, Your Worship. Uh, I'm here only to address what I understand <clears throat> are going to be some legal issues that may be raised by the neighbors. Uh, they haven't shared that with me. I don't know why. So you're then you're so here to only answer questions. I, I, I will uh, uh, at this stage answer questions, but to the extent those legal issues are raised during the course of the hearing, I will speak to them as new information. Then the some uh, council member would have to ask you for new information to respond to. So okay, That's for correct. at this time, your answer questions only. Okay, yes, sir. good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, got it. Okay. All right, now the first speaker is Michael Borland. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm ready. <clears throat> I believe we have a presentation as well. Okay. Perfect, there we go. Thanks. Good morning, Mayor Sohi and Council. My name is Michael Borland. I'm a manager at Green Space Alliance. My presentation will show why we chose a DC2 zone rather than a conventional zone, such as the RA7 or RA8 zones. Next slide, please. Section 720 of the zoning bylaw provides four reasons why the DC2 route should be the appropriate rezoning route. We focus on two main reasons. The site of the proposed development is significantly longer in the north-south direction. This is a unique characteristic that requires specific regulations to address massing and interface with the public realm and surrounding developments. Those regulations do not exist in the conventional zone. The proposed development requires specific regulations to ensure potential or perceived land use conflicts with neighboring properties are minimized. This is because the community expressed concerns about commercial development opportunities in the RA7 and RA8 zones. It also ensures the developer will provide infrastructure upgrades within our study area to address pedestrian safety, school operation, and increase laneway traffic. Next slide, please. From left to right, this slide shows the initial massing based on the RA8 zone used to design the DC2. The first image shows the west setback of six meters, an east setback of 7.5 meters, a south side setback of three meters, and a north side setback of three meters up to 14.5 meters and a six meter setback from 14.5 meters and above. The height of the building here is 23 meters. The second image illustrates the development of the S-shaped building, which helps to reduce massing impacts. The front cutout is 15.5 meters deep and reduces 19% of the facade length. The rear cutout is 17.5 meters deep and reduces 17% of the facade length. The third, the, sorry, the third image shows the height reduction only possible through DC2 regulations. The maximum height of the building was reduced from 23 meters to 20 meters. The lower levels are 17.5 meters tall and 14.5 meters tall. The fourth image illustrates the setbacks in the proposed DC2. The west setback is reduced to three meters to allow increased setbacks on the other sides. The north side setback is now six meters up to 14.5 meters in height and 14.5 meters above the 14.5 meter height mark. The south side setback is now 4.2 meters and the rear setback is kept at 7.5 meters. Next slide, please. As a result of our design approach, the S-shaped building form provides an adequate street interface by breaking the massing at key intervals. It is also efficient from an architectural perspective to make the design economically feasible. The pandemic has reminded us of the importance of designing private and communal spaces. From the adjusted massing, we began to design the building from the outdoor spaces before addressing the interior unit layout. The rooftop is not just for mechanical utilities, but is ornamental and useful for future residents. The exterior design, unit ceiling height, and large windows allow the sunlight to come deep into the units. Bedrooms are designed as suites with long-term functions such as working, sleeping, lounging, and storage. Ground-oriented units have individual landscape outdoor amenity spaces to provide both privacy for residents and transparency to the streets. 
The landscape features are well designed in keeping with the form and architectural expression of the building. Building materials resonate with many buildings found nearby and are used to articulate the building features, reduce perceived massing, and create human scale street interactions. Next slide, please. In summary, the proposed development reduces the provisions of the R88 zone. It proposes a custom made built form using the best elements of the RA7 and RA8 zones. The DC2 framework provides certainty of the type of development and interface that will be designed to transition to the small scale context. As an example, the proposed design features of the North interface are not found in conventional zone regulations. The merits of the DC2 are apparent in its ability to descriptively allow for mid rise infill development that is context sensitive, provide certainty to Edmontonians and Council on what type of development to expect, and implement a highly desirable built form with an appropriate interface to adjacent developments in the Windsor Park School. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we will go to Jared Kendlish. Yes, thank you. Uh, can I just go to the next slide, please? Good morning, Mayor Sohi and Council. My name is Jared Kalish. I'm a community planner and urban designer at Green Space Alliance. My presentation today will focus on our context analysis to develop this project. Next slide, please. To better understand the suitability of the development, our team looked at the surrounding context. This included an analysis of how the neighborhood evolved, how it can contribute to the transformative changes envisioned in the city plan, and its place in the draft Skona district plan. Firstly, we delineated a study area near the site to understand the impacts of infill development, and an area of influence to evaluate infrastructure upgrades and enhancements necessary to serve the development. Historically, the area was known as River Lot 3 and was subdivided in 1911. Since that time, Windsor Park has been an enclave of single detached houses and has largely been excluded from area redevelopment plans or other planning initiatives undertaken for similar mature neighborhoods. Since Edmonton's first zoning bylaw was introduced in 1933, Windsor Park has remained zoned for single detached housing. This lack of diverse housing types in the neighborhood has a significant impact on density and diversity when compared to other neighborhoods in Edmonton. A neighborhood with 90% single detached houses is the opposite of what a majority of Edmontonians envisioned in the city plan, regardless of the nodes and corridors boundaries. Next slide, please. The city plan states that ongoing residential infill will occur at a variety of scales and densities and designs within all parts of, the, of a neighborhood. For this project, the loss of seven single detached houses is minimal compared to the benefit of providing uh, housing diversity. For this project specifically, it's 171, one, two, and three bedroom units. And this is something that Edmonton is starting to experience in all neighborhoods. On the city plan map on the left, the site is located on the western edge of the University Garneau node. According to the city plan, major nodes are two kilometers across. And as you're aware, major nodes can accommodate towers, high rises, and mid rise buildings. Regardless of the draft Skona district plan or its final version, it's widely accepted as a good planning principle that appropriate transitions in height should be provided between high density nodes and developments and adjacent neighborhoods. This is exactly what the proposed development achieves. As shown on the transit mass network map on the right, as the city invests more in transit infrastructure, this development will help optimize future mass transit routes along 87th Avenue. Next slide, please. As a part of our study, we undertook an urban design analysis to understand the features of the study area. Public infrastructure built to serve Windsor Park includes walking paths and trails, bike lanes and bus routes, access to the River Valley, and prominent parks such as Emily Murphy and Horlack Park. The neighborhood is growing and maturing with a potential demand for diverse housing forms as Edmonton moves toward the vision for 1.25 million. Even if Windsor Park experiences less than its expected share of growth, density and housing diversity are critical to advancing affordable housing options for Edmontonians. As a principle of good urban design, there is an opportunity to provide ground level units and a unit mix within the building that's tailored to a demographic that's not prepared to move into skinny houses secondary suites or garden suites, but may appreciate the proximity to services, transit and park space within the university node. Next slide, please. Through collaboration with the school board, feedback from the community and administration's technical circulation comments, we were able to identify the need for upgrades to existing infrastructure. Uh, for instance, we observed that many parents use 119th Street as an alternative drop-off area, 
but that entrance to the school does not have a sidewalk or an appropriate crosswalk. We also noticed the existing bus stop and sidewalk along the north side of 87th Avenue between 118th and 119th Street are in poor condition. The, pro the proposed DC2 framework includes allocating funding for infrastructure enhancements, such as an additional crosswalk at 118th Street and upgrading the alleys and sidewalks at the edges of the site. To conclude, this development checks many of the boxes to integrate the Windsor Park neighborhood into Edmonton's citywide efforts for transformative changes for transformative changes that we all desire. Thank you, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Marcelo Figueroa. Uh, thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Good morning, Mayor Sohi and Council. My name is Marcelo Figueroa. I'm Associate Principal at Green Space Alliance. I'd like to start by acknowledging that infill projects are often controversial because they result in structural change that affect people's life. If you can be challenging due to the tensions between the status quo and a vision for the future, to retain people's trust and get us where we want to go, the structure change that in few may create must be guided by citywide values. We believe our project is a demonstration of a positive structure change towards building an Edmonton for everyone. It challenges people's doubts and preconceptions about what Edmonton could become over time. Thus, approving this rezoning would be a step toward making an affluent neighborhood like Windsor Park a little more accessible to all Edmontonians. Next slide, please. The City of Edmonton Infill data website shows that the mix of units in Windsor Park is slowly changing. As my colleague, Mr. Kendlich showed in his presentation, Windsor Park is a classic example of a predominantly single detached houses within Edmonton's core area. When the adjacent Windsor Terrace is complete, the mix of units in the midst of park will improve, but only to the extent that people who don't want to live in a single detached house can only live on the edge of this neighborhood. This is a problem when we think about promoting equity. An equitable Edmonton must allow people that are willing to trade private space for access to public amenities to live a little bit closer to those amenities. While housing forms are constrained by the market, council can shape what is built in our city and where. So allowing this type of development close to, a public, to public amenities is an opportunity for council to promote equity in a mature neighborhood. Next slide, please. I also like to uh, respond to some of the comments made at the last public hearing. The school board never ex expressed to us any concerns about the height and density of this development. On the contrary, EPS helped shape this project to better integrate it into Windsor Park but also argue that we don't need a policy plan to apply good planning principles that fits best around the school. The success of this approach can be seen in the number of low and mid-rise buildings that have been built around schools in our city, even before Edmund adopted the city plan. Moreover, recent planning initiatives like the Rutherford NASP and Windermere NASP clearly illustrate the application of this planning principle in our neighborhoods. Next slide, please. EPS and other city departments did express though that density at this location is also about the best use of our infrastructure. This will work because this development will provide easy access to enjoyable public amenities and keep housing costs more affordable. But most importantly, this development will help the city to provide quality and safe services at affordable property taxes through more efficient land use and increased ridership for HS in its future mass transit route along 87 Avenue. Next slide, please. But the best use of infrastructure and proximity to amenities are not the only reasons why this project is in the right location. As opposed to what some residents may argue, our project provides a transition without an abrupt change in build form to continue the context of the Windsor Park neighborhood. This appropriate transition is a gradual reduction in height and massing as per the draft these general policies. Next slide, please. In conclusion, this development complies with the city plan and the draft is going to city plan. We understand that where no specific policy applies for a particular sub-area of artistic plan, that sub-area should refer to the draft district general policies. We carefully applied these draft policies to design this development, because we hope that when adopted, 
they will allow for the expected change to happen to more in fuel like our project, according to the citywide values stated in the city plan. Edmund is changing because of those values. We hope for the better. This project represents a step in that direction. Thank you, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much to all of you for your presentations. Now we'll ask council members if they have any questions to the uh, applicant. Okay. I see no questions to the applicant. Now we will move to the uh, members of the public who are in opposition to the uh, to, to this uh, application. Uh, I will call your names, so please uh, come down. And Eddie Du, you'll be number one. If you could please come down, Eddie, where you are, raise your hand. There you are. Okay, please number one. Uh, Timothy Bush. In person, Timothy, please, number two, please. Uh, Karen Hughes, please, you'll be number three, if you could come down. Uh, Lucy Blickley, 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 okay. I'll be number four. Joe Miller, uh, you'll be number five. Uh, Bill Shores, on behalf of Elizabeth Miller, Joining remotely, Bill, Bill Shores. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I'm here. Okay, good, it'll be number six. Uh, Elisa Lee, in person, please come down. You'll be number seven. Sorry. Yeah, she's coming down, yeah. Uh, John Jamison, in person, John, there you are, you'll be number eight. Rolf Myers, in person, number nine, Rolf. Greg Mansell, you'll be number 10. Iona and Bureau, I'll ask again if Iona, are you there? Okay, you'll be number 11. Yeah. And uh, Melanie Bureau. Uh, yeah, we'll make sure that you are, uh, well, you're you'll be number, uh, speaker number uh, 13, but we'll make sure that we, uh, we you are able to uh, come close to the, uh, to the podium there. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Susanna Bureau, you'll be number, sorry, Melanie, you'll be number 12. Uh, Susanna, you'll be number 13. And David Lynch, I'll call again if David Lynch is here. Mayor, so I believe we're done now. The panels are full. Okay. So we can't panel them all together? Then uh, we'd have to do additional panels. We would have to do additional panels? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, so we will stop at Susanna Bureau. Okay. You can, Susanna, you can grab a chair. We'll call you, you can come back when you're turn to speak. You don't have to stand because it'll be, everyone is gonna speak for five minutes, then uh, uh, you'll be standing uh, for, for, you know, for quite a while, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, each of you will have five minutes to make your presentations, uh, and uh, once uh, this panel is concluded, then council members may have questions questions to you, and with that, we will start with uh, Eddie Du. Good morning, Mayor and City Councilors. I'm the owner of the house located directly north of the proposed rezoning lot. I'm here today on behalf of my family to express our opposition about this proposal. After living eight years in the southwest suburban area of Edmonton, we moved to Windsor Park in 2021 for its safe and peaceful environment and also for better education of our daughter. I want to point out that our decision by moving from the suburban into the central area is in lieu of the city's growth management framework. When I first heard about the six-story massive building breaking into our neighborhood, 
and it's going to sit right next to our house, the first thing that came to my mind is to move our family out of here. If the city permits such development, it's hurting hundreds of families who have lived here for decades, and it's chasing away people like us who want to raise their family in the neighborhood. We share the, three, the same three key concerns as outlined in the letter from the community league. It's too soon as we are not sure what the impacts are to the community by the 13-story Windsor Terrace being built right next to the lot. It's too big for being the largest building in this area once it's built, and it's in the wrong location for being in the interior of a residential community across from the school and the playground. On top of the three issues, being the first house next to the lot, we're also bearing many other serious concerns and impacts. First of all, the construction will pose huge safety concern to our daughters. During the construction, there will be open excavations, construction vehicles, and other potential safety hazards. Any of this could injure or even kill a person. We're already seeing a big safety hazard on 118th Street caused by the construction vehicles from the Windsor to Terrace. This vehicle is taking up the entire parking space along the east side of the street across the road. Parents have to park their, their cars along the west side of the school for a school drop-off, which makes 118th Street almost down to a single lane traffic during rush hour. The worst time happens in the afternoon as these vehicles are leaving at the same time as the school off, off time. The parents are concerned with their kids being so close to the traffic. The 118th Street is often being used as a construction laydown area sometimes with heavy, tra heavy vehicles crossing the road in and out of the site. The same situation could be expected from the construction of the new building. My daughters cross the road every day to go to the school. They like to play in our front yard in the summertime. As a responsible parent, I don't think any one of us would want to see our kids staying so close to a construction site like this. Secondly, the proposed condo will seriously intrude our personal life. We will never see sunlight coming from our south wall, especially in the winter time. That's the only direction we will have some sunlight during the day, and now we will be living in the big shadow for more than half the year. It would invade our privacy from a six-story building to a two-story building. Um, our entire family, our entire house and yard would be exposed under this building, and the building is so high that there's nothing we could use to block the view. It would add more traffic congestion coming in and out of our garage from the back alley. The back alley at, at its current state is too narrow and not designed to accommodate additional traffic from the new building. The location of the condo is not thoroughly considered. The current 118 street structure is all front-facing single-family home. It would look awkward and interfere with the continuity of the block with a transition from a six-story building to our house. Last but not least, our house value would be impacted by this condo. The resale value could, would be go down significantly with the condo sitting next to it. We bought our house at a much higher price, and we would bear a financial loss if this building were built. This is not tolerable for any family who spend most of their income on mortgage payment. Not even mention that our house foundation could be damaged during the construction. To sum up, this new proposal brings nothing but issues, concerns, and frustration to both our family and the community. I'm here today urging the city to reject the proposal. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Thank you so much for joining us. Next, we will go to Timothy Bush. Go ahead, please. Oh, uh, apparently we need some slides. Here you go. Good morning. My name is Timothy Bush. The Windsor Park Citizens Coalition cares a lot about how our community and city changes. When this massive development was announced, we became informed citizens to speak up on behalf of our friends and neighbors. 
and have served as an in information conduit for Windsor Park residents and have heard from hundreds of people. 95% of participants in city engagement for this project share our views, strongly opposing it. Next slide. To become informed citizens, we learned about the planning process, policy, and zoning bylaws. Such things as the residential infill guidelines and the mature neighborhood overlay, the city plan, district planning, the Skona district plan. And importantly, we learned that each neighborhood and district is not the same. They should be treated in such a way as to best serve that community and to build a well-functioning, vibrant city. Along the way, we made formal submissions during engagement stages, meeting with administration to discuss the proposal's problems. Next slide. I want to be clear. Oh, next slide. Next slide. <laughs> I want to be clear, the Windsor Park Citizens Coalition supports staging population growth to 2 million and putting growth in mature neighbourhoods. We can all agree that doing so has environmental and fiscal benefits, reducing our carbon footprint and gaining efficiencies for city operations. Let me also be clear, we oppose this development because of deficiencies, the lack of community support, the lack of due diligence by city planning's assessment, in inc uh, including errors of fact. Lack of fitting the development with the city plan, and in doing so ignoring not yet repealed or replaced city development principles, relying instead on still to be adopted draft policy. And we do not support this development because better options exist. Next slide. Located west of the University of Alberta in the Skona District, Windsor Park is changing rapidly. More than 1,500 residents call Windsor Park home, not counting the seasonal influx of several hundred university students. Contrast this with the city planning figure from 2016 of 1,285, and contrary to Westrich's brief that the majority of residents are uh, within the uh, 20 to 24 years of age. Rather, we have a mix of families, elders, university students, and younger children. 20% are 65 years of age and older. 40% are 30 to 64. 24% are 15 to 29. And 14% are under 15 years. Next slide. In terms of land use and housing mix, Windsor Park is transforming. Since 2016, subdividing lots and creating secondary suites added more than 100 units. And this friendly densification is speeding up. Within a block of this proposed development, you'll find 46 units in the Bentley con condominium, eight units in a three-story apartment south of the Bentley, 139 units in the very large 11-story Windsor Terrace currently under construction. A little further away, you'll find the Edmonton Mennonite Guest House, a short-term residential accommodation for patients and their families being treated in Edmonton's medical facilities. If approved, this development adds 172 units. That's 465 recent new and proposed units, more than doubling Windsor Park's housing in less than 10 years. Finally, you will hear other residents' concerns. How city planning made errors in its recommendation. How the development ignores the city plan's principles and relationships among planning documents. How the development fails to meet requirements of district plans and policy. How the development poses problems for the kindergarten to grade six school, daycare and play school across the street. How the development creates problems of safety, traffic and the environment. And how the development creates problems for its neighbors. In closing, it's of utmost importance that administration and city council follow the city plan, policies and good development practices in order to retain public trust and the reputation of our fine city. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, we will go to Karen Hughes. Thank you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, good morning, uh, everyone, Mayor Sohi and councillors. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. As my neighbor Tim Bush has indicated, we support the city plan and the goal of creating a more compact city. We see many benefits to that, we understand that, and we see a lot of change already happening 
in Windsor Park. But we also recognize there's many ways to achieve that and we do not support this proposal because of its massive size, its location in front of a school and the timing. And we also do not see that it meets the intention or direction of the city plan. We have, um, yeah, thank you. We have four main concerns that we would like to address. One is about what we see as a selective use of the city plan. And then flowing from that, three more points concerning the substantive arguments that are being made. That Westrich site is on the edge of a node, which is noted in page one and six, that it appropriately increases density, and that Westrich is seriously engaged with reasonable community concerns. I will address the first two of these, and my neighbor Lucy Bleakley will be carrying on with the second set of points. Next slide, please. Thank you. To start, we're concerned with what we see as a highly selective use of the city plan, and in this respect, we see these issues, they're pertinent to our own application, but they're very important for the city as a whole and for council to be thinking about. Two points here to make as quickly as I can. Um, administration has claimed at various points that the city plan lacks specifics. It refers to it as a high-level document on page six. In an email with administration, we were told that the city plan offers only general guidance on the site, but not details on specifics like exact boundaries. But as council knows, the city plan is actually a detailed document. It's a 182 page strategic plan. It has rich areas of discussion, which we've all educated ourselves about on the nodes and criteria for nodes, the growth management framework, the idea of phasing and sequencing to create manageable growth. And it's also informed by extensive technical reports, one on nodes and corridors, which is a, a fascinating report, and we've read it as well. And the whole goal is to create intentional development. That is one of the key goals of the city plan. So everyone knows what, we, what we're trying to do and what to expect and where it should be happening. But what we see is that very little of this detail has actually been considered. It appears in the admin report. And this relates to a second point we want to make here, that we really see a highly selective approach to how the city plan is being used. There's no systematic working through of the city plan in the administrative report, no step-by-step -step consideration of some of the elements I've just talked about, no checklist of whether the site meets the criteria of a major node, and there are actually a number of criteria for determining a major node, not simply proximity to a major institution. We see this as well, um, I, I'd like to just advance the slide, please, in terms of the policy review that was done for this application. Uh, next slide, please. This comes from a FOIP request that we made. These documents were delivered on Thursday and Friday, uh, roughly about a half a business day to work through them. This particular um, item comes from a report, uh, report from administration to Westrich. It's the review of the application. It's about a 30-page uh, document. And what we see is this is the policy review that appears to have been carried out. There's, it's a summary, there's also another one page. But again, we do not see a systematic approach that we would expect to see. What we say is, see is administration establishing that the site, quote, could be considered within the major node if only using the city plan, but no working through of criteria. And then it indicates that the district plan, quote, does not show the site within the node, but it should which seems to be a very evaluative comment to be making for what is supposed to be an objective review. At the end and the bottom, we do see one criteria that is being considered, which is density. Um, density is one criteria of a number for determining a major node. But what we see here is an inversion of the logic of the city plan. We hear the comment that Windsor Park is very low density and needs to take more because other neighborhoods are being asked of so much. Again, the idea of the city plan is to create strategic densification. High density, not low density, is one criteria of a number for considering whether a site is in a major node or a community is in a major node. Our point here is not to say we should be immune from you know, um, growth and densification. It's simply to point to the very selective, unsystematic, and almost unprincipled way that the city plan seems to have been used in this um, this report. Am I out of time? No. Yes, you're okay. out of time. Sorry I'm about sorry. that. So I had one more point around the major nodes, and I'm sorry I couldn't get to that. 
Yeah, well, maybe when come to questions, you can uh, uh, elaborate on that. Uh, next, we will go to Lucy Bla Blakeway. Sorry, um, right. my tongue is not twisting the right way. So, good morning. My name is Lucy Blakeway. Uh, can you turn your mic on, please? Okay, yeah. Hi, my name is Lucy Bleakley, and uh, I'm a long-term resident of Windsor Park. So, uh, can I have the next slide, please? And the one after that, please. And, yeah, and the one after this one, please. Thank you. That's good. Um, so, um, I'm going to address, does Westridge appropriately increase density in Windsor Park? So. The administration report argues that Westridge offers appropriate densification, but does not discuss the city plan's growth management framework in detail. Instead, it uses the growth management framework selectively, along with outdated 2016 census figures, to paint a misleading picture of growth and density in Windsor Park. We note the following. Windsor Park is already appropriately increasing in density and will continue to do so. Between 2016 and 2023, there was a 55% growth in units not captured by the 2016 census. An analysis of the general building permits database shows that Windsor Park has had 253 new units during these seven years, 73% are condominiums, and 27% is a mix of uh, lot splits, skinny homes, garden suites, and basement suites. Higher density in other neighborhoods has been, been achieved by apartment and condominiums on arterial roads, not on interior streets in front of a school. In the Kernan, there are apartments and condominiums on White Avenue, which is a four-lane road and primary transportation corridor. And in Belgravia, there are apartments and condominiums on 76th Avenue or near parks, well away from schools and most of these are only three-story. The high density in Garneau confirms why it anchors the University Garneau major node, but we have to note that 95% of neighborhoods in Edmonton have lower density than Garneau. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is, um, if you want to look at this graph on the um, x-axis, we have time, and on the y, we have the growth rate in percentage. So the administration report does not address the growth management framework, ignoring the fact that this has um, strong recommendations regarding the phasing and sequencing of growth to ensure that it is manageable for communities. So on this graph, on the blue line, is the city plan's phased growth of 100% over four decades. So we can see that um, on this plan, there should be a 25% growth in neighborhoods between 2020 and 2030, and a 50% between 2030 and 2050. So, but you can see from the graph that by the end of 2023, Windsor Park will have a, increased its density by 32%, and if the Westridge proposal goes ahead, by the end of 2026, it will have a 66% increase in growth. This is not manageable or well-sequenced growth and violates the premises of the growth management framework. Next slide, please. So has Westrich responded to our community concerns? The city plan's intent is that communities will have a voice balancing the interests of the communities and developers. 95% of Windsor Park residents oppose this building but the concerns listed in the admin report have not been heard. What are our major concerns? Well, firstly, the location and size of this building are inappropriate. Westrich has made a small um, response by reducing one uh, part of the building by 1.5 meters, <coughs> uh, reducing height by 1.5 meters. Our major concern is that the safety and traffic congestion. And somebody, one of my later colleagues will present a map to show this, but 118th Street and 89th Avenue is used by um, children and students going to and from daycare, the university, the school, and the preschool. The 
egress from the Westrich Development Parkade is into a six meter wide alley which enters 89th Avenue. 89th Avenue is a one way street with a bike lane. 800 car trips today per day will make this trip. This is going to lead mass to severe car congestion and pedestrian confusion, which may result in accidents. The only mitigation proposed by Westrich TV is to upgrade the alley surface to commercial standard. So, in conclusion, I think this Westrich development is the wrong building, in the wrong place, at the wrong time. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And next we will go to Joe Miller. Mayor Sohi, uh, city councilors. I'm uh, Joe Miller. I've been a Windsor Park resident for over 30 years. And all of my four kids went to the Windsor Park School. So I'm here with a little bit of knowledge about the Windsor Park area. And I welcome the opportunity to speak to you today on a matter that is vitally important to not only our community, but to all communities facing this type of planning issue. And that's the importance of the district general policy and district plans and the planning process. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. City administration did not incorporate the concepts of the draft district general policy, nor the draft SCONA district plan into their recommendations. This is wrong, and it's a fundamental flaw in their analysis. City administration describes the, the development as being in a transition zone. I have no idea what a transition zone is meant to mean. It's not a concept that I've seen in the planning guidelines that I've reviewed, and it begs the question, transition from what to what and where? To the west of the proposed development is the school. To the north are residential houses, and to east across the alley are more houses. And then if we move to 116th Street, we get to the university, where at the current time is a uh, surface parking lot. Now, if I could go back a slide. Oh, one more, please. There, are. thank you. I want to turn to what I think we all agree on, and that is everyone agrees with the principles in the city plan, and that includes densification. The implementation to achieve densification goals must be logical and they must be consistent. There must be intentional development. And the process is one of strategic densification based on a district's model, the 15-minute model. The focus on strategic densification is around existing density, amenities, and public transit. The 15 district plans establish the land uses for each community within each district. Next slide, please. The district plan and the district policy set out the means by which densification principles in the city plan are to be implemented. And that's important because these are current and they reflect best planning practices in city planning. Next slide, please. The district general policy and the Skona district plan are in reality extensions of the city plan. In short, they are to guide us on how to implement the densification goals of the city plan. Next slide, please. Windsor Park is in the Skona district plan. We're right up there on the left, or I think it's R3. Next slide, please. Windsor Park is shown in yellow on figure 6.6, .6, the land use concept of the Skona plan. If you go to the right, a little difficult to see with the uh, writing there, but under the right, under general land use, it identifies areas in yellow as being urban mix. Next slide, please. Figure 6.5 of the Skona plan shows that at both 1.25 million and then again at 2 million, the categorization of Windsor Park does not change. It never becomes a major node. So in relation to land use, it's urban mix now, it's urban mix at 1.25 million, it's urban mix at 2 million. And 
how do you then get the densification within the urban mix? That's addressed in the district general policy. Next slide, please. And there are three relevant criteria. The first is the development must integrate well within to the neighborhood. We're going to have neighbors come in and talk to you about how well this proposed development is going to incorporate or integrate into their neighborhood. The second is the size. It's to be a low-rise development, and that's defined in the district policy as being up to four stories. And the third is location. It's to be on an arterial road or a service road. Next slide, please. So the question is, is this proposed development consistent with the strategic goals and spirit and intent of the city plan? And the answer to that question must surely come from a review of the documents specifically prepared to implement the strategic goals reflecting the spirit and intent of the city plan. Next slide, please. The Scona district plan and the district general policy answer that question. It tells us the category of land use within each community. It tells what densification development is appropriate for that category. In other words, it tells us what can be built and when. So the answer to the question of whether this proposed development is consistent with the principles and strategic densification and the spirit and intent of the city plan is no. It's in the wrong location. It's across from the school interior in the uh, school in the interior of a community, not on an arterial road, and it's too big. This is a massive development. It's the size of the football field that the Edmonton Elks play on, and it's 50% too high. I would respectfully ask that the bylaw uh, be denied. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, uh, next, we will go to uh, Bill Shores on behalf of Elizabeth Miller. Joining remotely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, my remarks should be heard in the context of the factual and planning framework that you just heard. In council's consideration of this matter from a legal perspective, Council needs to take into account all relevant planning considerations. Although you do have discretion in the establishment of a DC district, it is a fundamental principle in our rule of law that that discretion is not unlimited. It has to be exercised for the purposes of part 17 of the Municipal Government Act. And in the exercise of that discretion, you have to take into account all relevant planning considerations. From a legal perspective, what are the considerations in this context? The first is the city plan, which is in effect today. The second is the draft SCONA district plan. Turning first to the city plan, as you well know, a, a municipal development plan must address the future land use within the municipality and the manner of and proposals for future development in the municipality. The purpose of a city plan or the MDP is to achieve the orderly, economical and beneficial development, use of land and patterns of human settlement. In this case, the city plan identifies specific areas as major nodes of development. As you've heard from Mr. Miller, this site is not a major node in the district, in the city plan. To overcome this gap, respectfully, administration has woven out of thin air the concept of a transition point, uh, suggesting that at a transition point, you can densify. It is out from a, from a legal perspective, the, the site is outside the major node under the city plan. It's not a major node for higher density development. It is inconsistent with the city plan. Secondly, the issue of a draft plan. The SCONA district plan is a relevant consideration for you, even though it is a draft plan. Administration failed to take this into account in their report. Respectfully, council must take it into account. It is a relevant planning consideration. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Since 1979, it has been clear that draft plans are relevant planning considerations. They need to be considered. Uh, next slide, please. As recently as 2019, the Court of Queen's Kings Ben uh, recognized that if a council failed to take a draft statutory plan into consideration, it would err in failing to consider relevant considerations. With respect to the Edmonton district planning process, the process of establishment of district plans is almost complete. Phase five, which includes the presentation of district plans and plans proposed for repeal at public hearing is set for this summer on into January 2024. This charter bylaw, which would be inconsistent with uh, the district plan, should not be approved at this time. As Mr. Miller pointed out, it is this area within the district plan is not slated for this sort of development. Uh, the site is designated as urban mix under the district general policy, the urban mixed land use area supports low rise developments only in specific areas. And this is not one of those areas. So in conclusion, this is outside of major node for the purposes of the uh, city plan, and it is inconsistent with the draft district plan. In the consideration of all relevant planning considerations, it should be rejected. I also note that it is also inconsistent with the residential infill guidelines. Thank you. Those are my submissions. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, next, we will go to Lisa Lee. Yeah, good morning. Can you turn your mic on, please? Oh, there thank you. you. Yeah. Good morning, councillors and, and Mr. Mayor Sohi. My name is Eliza Lee, and I'll be presenting on the problems arising from the Westridge proposal. My submissions are two part. First, I'll describe how the Westridge proposal is both too big and in the wrong location. And second, I'll discuss the consequences arising from these design qualities. The Westridge proposal is too big in the sense that it is almost the length of a professional football field. It is primarily six stories in height and only tapers off to four stories at the very northern section of the building. As Joe mentioned earlier, Windsor Park is designated as an urban mixed area and it accomplishes densification through small scale infills and low rise or four story buildings that are built directly on arterial or service roads. Next slide, please. The proposal is in the wrong location in that it is not built on the corner site that fronts onto an arterial or service road. In fact, it is built in the interior of our community across from the Windsor Park Elementary School, the kindergarten, and the daycare. As well, I'll note that it is 950 meters from the closest LRT station and two to three kilometers from the closest grocery stores. Next slide, please. This creates a myriad of problems, and I'll discuss four. The first is that it increases safety and traffic concerns around the school and the daycare that is attended every Monday to Friday by around 225 young children. And as such, safety and traffic volumes are paramount considerations. The building is set to be 172 units with 236 parking spaces that will necessarily increase traffic levels, con congestion during drop off and pick up zones around the school and elevate traffic flow in the neighborhood broadly. It is contrary to the city's vision zero strategy that acknowledges traffic injuries are preventable and mitigated by good design, which we submit are absent here. The transportation report that was submitted by Huberman Transportation Consultants Incorporated minimizes the impact of this proposal on the school site, the surrounding area, and the community broadly by using non-representative data upon which they build conservative estimates, and I'll discuss two here. The first is that it assumes all traffic flowing in and out of the Western proposal will flow through the back alley. 
However, the city administrative report acknowledges that if traffic backs up in the alley, drivers will exit on 118th Street and elsewhere. Next slide, please. The second assumption is that 119th Street can absorb the traffic congestion on 118th Street during school pickup and drop off hours. However, 119th Street is already busy during those hours and lined with cars. You heard earlier that their mitigation strategy is adding a pedestrian sidewalk on 119th Street, but that does not reduce the existing vehicular traffic nor the issue of windrows during the winter months. As you'll note, Windsor Terrace on the bottom right-hand corner of the diagram, it will, there will be many cars backing in and out of that building. And, and according to the FOIP request that we received, the city administration only did one additional observation around the school on January 16th, 2023. That's a Monday between the hours of 8 to 9 a.m. Next slide, please. As well, there will be increased traffic uh, along the alleyways uh, on the east to, that run east to west and north to south as indicated by the yellow arrows. Conservative estimates around 750 two-way daily trips along those alleys and both these alleys are around six meters wide with power poles that cannot safely accommodate two-way traffic. Next slide, please. The third problem is with respect to the proposal's environmental impacts. It will result in the loss of an entire block of mature trees, shrubs, and green space as well, it fails to incorporate any energy efficient or sustainability designs. Next slide, please. The final problem is that it actually fails to increase housing diversity. What we need more, in the, what we need more of in the community is family-oriented buildings, three to four bedrooms to purchase, and not another primarily one to two bedroom luxury rental building, which is not truly accessible to everyone and does not actually support principles of equity mentioned earlier. And for these reasons, we would respectfully ask the councillors and Mr. Mayor to vote in opposition of this application. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eliza. Next, we will go to uh, John Jameson. Uh, good morning. My name is John Jameson. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about public trust. So trust. Trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. How does local government earn the trust of stakeholders like residents, businesses, and developers? Well, government sets smart strategic goals and then guides the stakeholders towards those goals. Next slide. Once goals are set, government uses strategic plans, project plans, and implementation policies to unify the thinking of the stakeholders. In the ideal process, the strategic plan articulates the goals in the path and approved project plans define work packages that advance us along the path. And experienced, trusted stakeholder representatives develop, and develop implementation policies that specify the who, what, where, when, and how, why and how of on-strategy project plans. If your plan is off policy, you are off strategy. The policies are like playground rules. If we follow the policies, everyone has fun and no one gets hurt. Stakeholders trust government to scrutinize each project and approve only those that are on policy. These little developers here are not turned loose until their plans are reviewed and approved. Next slide. City of Edmonton normally follows this model. The tried and trusted residential infill guidelines have been in place since 2009. In 2020, the city plan became the strategic plan. In 2023, the new district general policy and plans will augment our implementation policies. But in 2020, we had a problem. The Westridge proposal was somehow recommended for approval, even though it does not comply with policy. Next slide. Analysis shows this project is off policy, particularly regarding size, location, and community concerns. Furthermore, the administration report itself states that the project is off policy. In one place, it states, development does not align with the residential infill guidelines locational criteria However, the criteria is too restrictive. In another place, the report states, public engagement feedback highlighted that current draft work on the Scona district plan and the district general policy does not support this scale of development at this location. The administration report does not ref refute this claim. Relevant policies have been dismissed or ignored. The project does not merit a tick in the approved box. Next slide. 
It is important that all stakeholders stick to policies in our complex city environment, follow policies, and city development proceeds with clarity, consistency, and certainty. Stakeholders understand what can be built and where. Stakeholders know what to expect from each other. Stakeholders who disagree have a reference point that fosters constructive dialogue. The process is less adversarial. The processes speed up. And the reputation of the city as a trusted, professional, competent partner is enhanced. The city attracts new businesses and people. Next slide. On the other hand, trust suffers if we allow stakeholders to skirt our policies. And in fact, we read in the local media only recently of the public's concern in this regard. Next slide. When a stakeholder stubbornly refuses to conform to policy, we sense a hint of arrogance, an attitude that says, I don't care, I know best. An attitude that is disrespectful of the time, effort, expenditure, and patience invested in policy development by learned, experienced stakeholders. If you relent in the face of this, if you are lax in your insistence that policies be followed, you lose the public's trust. Stakeholders no longer trust the process. Precedents are set and consistency suffers. Waivers and exceptions are expected and demanded. Relationships become adversarial. Favoritism is suspected. Processes, processes become bogged down in arguments, negotiations, and appeals. The reputation of the city as a trusted, professional, competent partner is tarnished. And we all pay a price because, sadly, potential new businesses and residents go elsewhere. Next slide. You've been asked to allow an exception to Edmonton's policies. We believe that you, as our elected representatives, need to take charge and enforce the rules. Our ask, support orderly on-policy infill development in our community. Boost public trust in you and your city. Withhold your approval of this non-compliant project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, next, we will go to Ralph Myers. Mr. Mayor, councillors, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, briefly, my wife and I immigrated in the 70s. We moved from Garno to Windsor Park. Our two boys went to the elementary school. We upgraded the semi-bungalow to two stories, and we enjoy the family-oriented, increased, uh, mixed neighborhood. Windsor Park is, in fact, densifying organically. There's a welcome evolution with affordable skinnies, lane suites, and solar panels on top of them, with young families and away from 87th Avenue, north and south. Windsor Park is quickly densifying. We, my wife and I, rent two rooms to an immigrant from Myanmar, and that contributes in a way to densification. And there are eight preschool-aged children in the block, 117th, 118th Street. This family character, family-oriented character with students mixed in and retirees like us is worth preserving. We are here to oppose this DCP2. Our objections are based on the following. Next slide. Yes, thank you. A 14 and a half meter structure with rooftop amenities across from our garage means significant loss of privacy, loss of sunlight, hence a negative impact on the property value, according to a real estate agent, 100 to 200,000 for us. The shading study says we will have no sun after 4 p.m. between March and September. These impacts are additional to effects that can be expected from the 11 level 139 units of Windsor Terrace because its underground garage access is in the east-west lane, as, it is, as is that of the Bentley, the 39 units. The safety risks and the congestion in the north-south alley uh, will create havoc, and they will be significant. In short, for residents of 117th Street, like us, the proposed development or redevelopment is like a huge cruise liner docked permanently across the alley. We face brutal, not gentle, densification. 
So what to do? I urge you to reject the present application, preserve the Windsor Park interior as a family-friendly mixed neighborhood that includes students and retirees. And this will ensure the safety of school children and preschool children and enhance the use of the bike path along 89th Avenue leading to the U of A. For us, the ideal proposal would bring row houses with shared walls on either side of the existing two skinnies. That is affordable, family-sized homes with great access to the school across the street. And Westbridge, Westbridge on its website actually shows us they can do that. They have done it in the Okanagan fronting a lake. In conclusion, here comes what we will lose as residents. Pictures, please. Next slide. So this is the sunset from our deck. Next slide. You see on the far left corner, it, there, the pitch there is the uh, Windsor Terrace, almost complete. Next slide. That's the sunset we now have from our deck. Next slide. That's the sunset we will lose. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Next, we will go to Greg Mansell. Good morning. My name is Greg Mansell. I have lived for the better part of four decades across the lane from the seven single family homes that may be slated for demolition. Next slide. This development causes me deep concern about the shading of my patio and backyard. Next slide. But of a greater concern to me is traffic. The traffic in my lane and the surrounding streets. Every morning around 7.30, I leave my garage with my dog and drive down the lane on my way to the Belgravia off-leash. Next slide. Crossing the east-west alley intersection at that time of day is usually possible. I creep past the Bentley Condominium handicapped parking and ease across the public sidewalk onto 87th Avenue. I creep because the sight lines here are poor at best for both pedestrian or vehicular traffic, whether exiting or entering. Typically an hour later, we return via 118th Street in the Windsor Park Elementary School. At that time of the day, the school drop-off traffic is helter-skelter. From all directions come children, some holding the hands of caregivers, parents, grandparents, old and young alike. The vehicular traffic is somewhat intense on the two usually quiet non-arterial accesses, 118th Street and 119th Street. Next slide. On 119th Street, those children, usually older, get dropped off to cross through the playground to the school. On 118th Street, many drivers park and accompany the little ones. The pedestrian traffic is just as hectic with a constant flow of kids, strollers, and wagons. They arrive from all directions across the park, over the playground, down the sidewalks, and out of the alleys. Some children arrive in carriers attached to bicycles ridden by their caregivers. Next slide. On the south side of 87th Avenue, some children attend the early and after school care program at St. George's Anglican Church. They are shepherded across busy 87th Avenue by responsible adults wearing high visibility vests. Next slide. Young children line up at the south door of the Windsor Park School waiting to enter the University and Community Early Learning Center. A short time later, even more younger ones arrive to attend the kindergarten at the Windsor Park Community League. Of course, this process reverses itself at the end of the day when the children leave to return home. Next slide. My back lane is six meters wide. That's 20 feet, property line to property line. Acceptable by city standards for the traffic expected to be generated by the proposed development. There are five power poles along that section of the lane and they extend about four feet into the lane, reducing the effective driving width. With the width of two average size residential vehicles reaching 14 feet, that leaves a clearance of 24 inches in total or eight inches between the pole, car mirrors and the fence when passing. In a Zoom meeting with a city planner, a traffic engineer and the traffic engineer contracted by Westridge Pacific, it was suggested that two vehicles could pass each other by snaking down the lane between the poles. In other words, move off public property onto private property. Of course, only doable if the private property is not occupied. 
In other words, if the roadway surface is in perfect condition, not rutted by road or by snow, if speed and pedestrian or bicycle traffic are not an issue, if the drivers are confident and skilled, it is doable, not necessarily safe. Next slide. Another component to the congestion in the lane is the City of Edmonton waste disposal containers. Their labeling states they're to be positioned three feet from the nearest fence. In that situation, only the disposal trucks can navigate the lane. With the addition of hundreds of trips generated by the Windsor Terrace high rise, only time will tell how safe the lane will be for the competition between pedestrians and bicycles, along with the service and delivery trucks. Adding another massive development is proposed, dumping even hundreds more trips per day into the alley only compounds the situation. Until the high rise terrace is occupied and the traffic patterns are known, we have no serious reason to justify this future ponderous structure. In conclusion, a smaller, lower, more sensitive and less invasive development would go a long way in an effort to reduce the many legitimate concerns of mine and my neighbors. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, next we will go to Iona Biro. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to this proposal. Our home is directly across the alley from the tallest part of the proposed Westridge building. Um, next slide, please. That's the view from our backyard. Uh, you'll soon hear from my mom who's aging in place with my sister as her caregiver. My sister had also planned to age in place, but that's a plan that's now in jeopardy from this development. As for me, I loved growing up in a community full of students, university and hospital staff members, diverse families, and newcomers to Canada. And with two kids of my own who will be looking for their own housing shortly, I'm a huge supporter of building more housing in this country and in Edmonton. I love the garden suites that have popped up all over. Two of them were built by our next door neighbors. They represent the best of friendly densification. Our plans to add a garden suite ourselves were in part inspired by a garden suite workshop we attended that was co-hosted by Councillor Ashley Salvador. Those plans are now thrown into jeopardy by the proposed development. Due to the ongoing construction of the high-rise Windsor Terrace on the corner of 87th Avenue and 18th Street, we've already experienced a significant loss of sunlight. Now we know that the Westridge proposal will cause a near total loss of afternoon and evening sunlight. Uh, precious light we use for gardening and enjoying our backyard. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see from the slide, that's a complete loss of privacy in our backyard, which will also make the prospect of a garden suite quite a difficult sell. Recently, I drove past a building built by Westridge not too far away in Belgravia. It's built on a major artery and is located right beside the LRT line. The proposed building, on the other hand, is not on a major artery. It's on a residential street, as many have said, in the heart of our community across from our community school. And it's not close to the LRT, and it isn't the major node and will massively spike car trips up our alley to 800 on a daily basis, creating traffic safety and emissions concerns for residents. It also includes only a handful of family-friendly uh, suites, six, I think. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the dining room window of our house looking uh, southwest to 87th Avenue. So perhaps most importantly, the proposed building would be adjacent to Windsor Terrace, the high-rise building you can see under construction in the slide whose impact we can't measure until it's fully occupied in 2024. Windsor Terrace is being built next door to the Bentley, a four-story building that also flanks 87th Avenue. So um, I think this is a case where a developer saw these two multi-unit buildings and uh, probably thought it would be easy to shoehorn in an even larger building beside them. But the Westridge proposal is an outlier. Unlike the other two buildings facing 87th Avenue, this will change the character and nature of an interior residential street and it will impact the entire community. Imagine 50 vehicles per hour going up and down our back alley, exhaust, noise, traffic, uh, it's all been mentioned before. I believe densification done well, like the Bentley, enhances the neighborhood, brings public benefits in the form of more and new housing. It does this without disrupting a vibrant community that is rapidly densifying through skinnies, uh, secondary suites, garden and garage suites. Densification done for the sake of it runs the risk of ruining the very community that it wants to be part of. We support densification that Edmonton needs, but with the high rise currently under construction, Windsor Park will not only meet, but will far exceed the very densification targets that the city has set for it. 
So in fact, contrary to what you believe, we have added 32% more density in the last three years, as shown in the graph previously. Uh, next slide. So I must ask, why the city would consider a massively insensitive development that would far overreach our community's densification target? Why privilege a developer over the interests of residents who are, who've already welcomed two very large apartment buildings in the same city block? And perhaps most importantly, why would we rush to approve this building before the actual impact of current construction can be measured in real life experience rather than questionable and very limited traffic observations? We welcome densification, it's obvious if you visit Windsor Park. Driving along 87th Avenue today, you'll see Windsor Terrace that will bring 139 new units and hundreds of new people into our community. Then if you were to walk along 818th Street, try to imagine a row of brand new townhomes, walk-ups, row houses, fourplexes, skinnies, or any combination of these instead of the large monolithic structure being proposed. We know the developer could opt for this type of more sensitive densification because they've done low-rise developments before. If they did this in Windsor Park, we would support and welcome it. In the spirit of compromise and orderly development for a much-loved neighborhood, I ask city councillors to reject this proposal, particularly in light of, our, of Windsor Park's rapid pace of densification. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you so much. Uh, Next, we will go to Melanie Bureau. So if someone can please uh, assist Melanie to come to the, close to the podium. Well, thank you for joining us. Is your mic on? Oh. Okay, go ahead. go ahead, please. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Melanie Biro, and I thank you for this opportunity to present my views. Uh, slide, please. We built our house in the 1950s. My two daughters walked to Windsor Park School and had local university students as babysitters. We planted spruce and fruit trees and a full garden with berries, veggies, and flowers in our backyard. We annually re relished the jams that we made from our rich harvest. I observed many positive changes over the 70 plus years in Windsor Park. The recent growth is very welcome. Many garage and garden suites many sets of skinnies, and the Bentley. All of these advanced a friendly de uh, densification that is both needed I've lost my notes. One moment, please. <laughs> All right. Uh, but I can only describe that uh, the Westridge proposal has an opportunistic move by a developer. Next slide, please. I object to the proposed DCP2. The enormous Westridge structure will block much precious sunlight, and also it means a significant loss of privacy, especially using our backyard. Our property value will decrease immensely, as noted by our neighbors. We also share our neighbors' concern about the exponential, about the exponential increase in traffic and the resulting safety and emissions concerns. Next slide, please. Dear City Council, please reject this application. I'm very much in favor of more family housing and friendly densification in Windsor Park. What I oppose is the kind of overdevelopment that would permanently damage a wonderful family neighborhood. City staff, even with the best of intentions and a laudable goal of densifying cities, 
can overstep. The problem is that these oversteps are impossible to reverse once the huge building is approved and built. The damage will have been done. Therefore, I'm urging you to reject this unsuitable and massive structure that represents the tipping point of my community. Instead, support family-sized housing across from the school, enriching our community with children. Thank you for your attention. And please, help me celebrate my 100th birthday next year so I may continue to age in place in Windsor Park. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. <laughs> and it's so lovely to see you. And will we wish you happy birthday in advance. Can we do that? <laughs> now, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, next we will go to Susanna Bureau. So we just realized we uh, ended the panel after the previous speaker, so now we would move into the next panel. Oh, so, so Susanna would have to wait then. Sorry. No problem. Okay, because they were, okay, we ended the panel. Okay. All right. So now we'll go to questions. So if you could uh, just move back, to, uh, Susanna, to the seat, and we'll ask. Uh, uh, Eliza to come back as number seven. Good. No, stay there. Stay there. Uh, okay, questions, colleagues. Questions. Uh, Councillor Jans. Uh, thank you for this, Mr. Mayor. Um, I really appreciate the speaker laying the speakers laying out such a a, um, a narrative through the project. It's very helpful. I, to be honest, I think it's answered a lot of the questions that I, I did have. I did want to go back to uh, guest Hughes around uh, nodes and corridors. There was an additional point you wanted to add. Yes, thank you. I don't think the slides are available. Are they? Um, and I'm sorry I ran out of time. The point I wanted to make around nodes and corridors is that, oh, thank you very much. If you could go back to that. Um, uh, just going forward there, yes. The point I wanted to make here um, is that we really question the argument that city administration has put forward that the site is on the edge, at the edge of a node is the terminology used. They referred to a vague red circle when we asked them about you know, how they were conceptualizing this. Again, it seems to reflect this idea that there's not sufficient detail in the city plan. Um, but as noted on the right-hand side of this um, slide, we can see from the technical reports that there are actually maps uh, that were de developed that show that the node ends on 116th Street. That map was developed as part of the city plan process. It's one of a number of technical reports that, uh, that explains the philosophy of nodes, the idea of building on existing density, and it was developed by planners, senior planners within the city and at the University of Alberta. And they, they basically conclude that report by saying they found a logical hierarchy of existing density in the city that we should build on. If you move to the next slide, if that's possible, I just, we wanted to mention as well, there are many other maps that city admin could have looked at. The one on priority growth areas, which is on the left-hand side, again shows that the node ends, is intended to end at 116th. And just to emphasize, that's two city blocks away from the Westrich site. So the idea of an edge, that's not my uh, definition or understanding of an edge. Uh, it's, it's clearly not in a major node. And I think importantly, this was clear to Westrich. They indicate that they're outside of the note in their urban brief. They say so very specifically. And I think this is a really good illustration of the concept of intentional development. This is a moment where city administration should actually say you're not in the node and be directing them elsewhere to an appropriate location. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that in, the, again, the technical report for nodes and corridors, there's a very, very helpful discussion on criteria that need to be considered for determining a node. 
And there are actually 12 criteria. There's a long discussion of many pages. And when you look at those and you work through them systematically, again, a systematic approach for, for identifying a node, you will see that Windsor Park and the Westridge site actually meet very few of those. And so again, this is just a concern that we have, that we really do not feel we have a principled comprehensive use of the city plan in relation to the question of the location of the site vis-a-vis -vis a major node. And uh, if I may have a follow-up question, I can't see my clock, am I in time? Uh, to uh, guest uh, Miller, uh, the, uh, I was wondering, had uh, there was an allusion to um, kind of the, the hierarchy of process here, and I, un I understand that this, um, the community was, the land assembly had been taking place for quite a while, and if I'm understanding what I read from your submission, um, the developer would have been well aware of what the rules were as they were assembling this land, and then chose to bring forward this proposal under the speed limit as it was, so to speak. Um, and then this this is sort of new for the coalition. Is that is that how I was, how I was reading it? So I, th I think that's right. So what we would have is the residential infill guidelines that are there and have been there for a decade or more. Uh, we then have the city plan. Uh, and as Karen pointed out, this does not fall within the major node is set out in the city plan. So these are things that would have been known to the developer when they were uh, acquiring the lands in, in, uh, in question. In addition, presumably as a sophisticated developer, they would have known about the development of the draft general policy and the development of the draft SCONA plans. These are things that should have been well known to any sophisticated developer. Right. And uh, when the Citizens Coalition approached them about doing something like row housing and res urban character row housing or something else, what was their response? Um, I think what I'd prefer to do with that is uh, leave that to uh, Elaine Solez of the Windsor Park Community League uh, because they had direct communication with uh, Westrich. Our involvement was more through the city administration indicating the concerns that we had with the hope that they would uh, listen to us and take steps to address it with Westridge. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Jans, Councilor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just want to take a moment to thank all the speakers who, who came out today. I agree with Councilor Jans. Uh, really comprehensive presentation and um, presented in a way that made uh, a lot of sense throughout. So just want to direct a question at Speaker Shores, who I think was online. Yes. Yes. Great. Um, yeah. So you mentioned, you know, the importance of considering uh, all relevant city planning documents. You pointed to the city plan in particular, as well as the Scona district plan, uh, the draft Scona district plan, um, as a relevant consideration. And I agree that that is is for sure relevant. Um, I also think its nature as a draft is is really important to consider as well, recognizing that um, that is, you know, in in flux. Um, so I'm wondering if you can comment on the draft nature of the SCOTA district plan? Yes, uh, in terms of the law on it, uh, in the Funk case, uh, with the early the Court of Appeal case, that argument was made. Somebody said, well, it's just a draft. When, it, when it's finalized, council may change it. When it's finally adopted, it may be changed. And the Court of Appeal said, despite all of that, it remained a relevant planning consideration. It obviously doesn't have the same weight as an adopted plan, but it is a significant planning consideration, particularly uh, when you look at this particular proposal, which both have, which is outside the city plan uh, node um, and is inconsistent with the residential info guidelines. You've got uh, an existing problem. And then we look towards the future plans of the city, which are documented in a crystallized draft uh, for discussion, um, the same problems arise. So it still has significant weight in my submission. Okay, and just to, to pick up on that point, your reference to a crystallized draft, um, are you aware of the discussion that took place uh, January 17th at Urban Planning Committee about the, the draft district plans? I'm not. Okay, yeah, because there, I mean, and that's just sort of top of mind for me, um, because at that, 
at that urban planning committee, there was a pretty fulsome conversation and there's actually direction provided by committee uh, that administration provide a report that includes the revised district plans and revised district plan policy that incorporates um, engagement feedback as to how the district plans can provide additional policy and map clarity um, in regards to directing development and investment at the 1.2 and 2 million population milestones. And I think you know, that's some of the tension we're feeling today. Um, is that that clarity piece because uh, I think oftentimes when there's yeah a line drawn on a map there's uh, the idea that that is absolutely certain um, and at that committee meeting we discussed the importance of recognizing that lines sometimes really mean a gradient um, as opposed to a, a firm line so um, I really appreciate your thoughts on that uh, I thought you did a, an excellent job of, of providing a comprehensive presentation um, any sorry any any additional thoughts on that piece uh, yes, just just one observation. It's the plan that exists now, and so if if it's not developed far enough to give great weight to, then we should wait because it's obviously going to be very very significant. It's going to have a major impact on this community and other communities. This development shouldn't be pr proceeded with under DC zoning while that process is live. Then, so it's either, either the line has some value, or the process isn't advanced enough, and it's inconsistent with the current residential infill guidelines and city plan as it sits right now. And maybe just, just one, one more question then, when it comes to specifically DC uh, applications, uh, th those are opportunities to um, provide context-specific, site-specific uh, direction and, and a certain degree of, well, a high degree of certainty, um, the highest degree of certainty as to what uh, it can be expected on that site, um, I guess, yeah, any, any thoughts on that? Like the, the nature of a DC does provide that degree of certainty and, and is, um, and I'll ask this to administration, but uh, does seem to be justified based on um, current planning documents as well as the future planning documents that are on the horizon. So DCs are exceptional. Um, they provide certainty to the developer. They, they are inconsistent with the overall orderly planning process uh, that has been discussed by others in this there. The city, it's, in, it's inconsistent with the city plan, it's inconsistent with the residential infill guidelines, and it's inconsistent with the future plans as they sit today. So what I would say is that a DC is not an opportunity to provide rough shot. It should be used, it should be a carefully calibrated instrument used uh, where it's in the, the overall public interest and is consistent with orderly planning. I think you still need to have regard for um, the city plan and for the uh, uh, proposed school plan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor uh, Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. First of all, thank you to each and every one of you for your presentation and also uh, uh, your understanding that densification is important and that you are not against uh, infill and uh, more more densification in in a mature neighborhoods I appreciate appreciate that though the i think differences on scale and uh, and the and the location so maybe i'll start with uh, 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 timothy bush so you identified as as a, you know as a coalition um, you talked about that this not being in the in the nodes and the corridors so that's one issue that you have that is not uh, aligned with city plan, right? Can you identify, like, what are some of the other, maybe two other things that you have that this plan is not in, con con does not comply with the city plan? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, one of them is that it's, uh, it, it's it, you have to forgive me, Mayor, Mayor Sohi, I didn't speak to all of those uh, okay maybe things. anyone anyone from the coalition can you highlight other than nodes and corridors what are maybe uh, uh to uh, uh karen hughes right uh, what are the yes. other yeah, few issues you. that i'd be happy to yeah. address that uh one of the issues that was raised uh, by lucy is around the pace of growth okay and so and that's part of the growth management framework and the phasing and sequencing ideas so we tried to show, and we understand that, that, that those frameworks are citywide, they're macro, but people live in a micro space. They live in their neighborhoods. And the idea of, of the growth framework and phasing is to create manageable growth. And I think this is a really important consideration for council because 
if you continue to create very challenging situations for neighborhoods, you're going to face enormous backlash, in my view. So in, in words, supply. like you are taking, in your view, this enough? No, 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 no. We already. Ex we expect more growth. What we're talking about is the pace of growth. Okay. And when I had a discussion, just very quickly, I was quite alarmed to understand that the, the, the applications are not even considered relative to information on net growth in units. There's no tracking going on. I mean, I had to go in and spend hours on the general building permit site to understand what our growth rates are. I asked Mr. McClellan, is this available? Could he very helpfully provided dated 2016 census data? But, you know, the city doesn't even know. Do we know how many units have been built in Skona? Do you know the pace of growth for the entire okay. district or the neighborhoods? Why are we not talking about these things? Why is there not a sort of a dashboard for what we're trying to achieve. So we're not against growth. We've made that very clear. Yeah. What we're saying is you are jamming growth yeah. into one city block. It's actually 3,000, over 3,000% 3, increase on one single block of our neighborhood. Okay. And it is not reasonable. Okay, we'll ask sense, that. It's not what? fair and it does not make sense, which is another definition of reasonable. Okay. So the growth management framework, and secondly, in terms of citizens actually having input, that this is a respectful process. The engagement here on this, and I will be blunt, this is my view, it has been substandard. You have had citizens in this community providing their input on this to Westridge. Westridge has reduced the height by 1.5 meters. Is that considered a serious response? Okay. You know, that is a real problem, and we have a public engagement charter that the planners sign on to that says engagement is going to be respectful and it is going to be heard, and it is not. And the city is being, spending over $32 million a year on communication and engagement. So if you want to engage the community and you want input, you should actually hear it and use it. And if you don't, you can save $32 million for something else. So those are two principles, the growth management framework pacing and the role of communities, Got those it. are two. So you, you feel that you have not been heard by the, the applicant? I, I think our community feels not at all. If you see what Westridge came back with, there some of the responses are, again, to be blunt, they're ridiculous. We have, you know, the traffic concerns alone. We had concerns about the transportation report to begin with. Is the alley situation workable? I, we don't see that it is. I mean, putting commercial concrete on a road, that's a technical solution. It's not how are all these cars going to, you know, get in and out. And also, the real issue is the spillover on in front of the school. That is yeah. a huge issue. We've had, we all, a lot of us have had children at that school or do, and it really, you know, we need to look at why are we shoehorning something this big into such a small space where we would welcome 172 units, but can we do it and can we compromise to find some reasonable ways to do this? Put the okay. building thank on a thank I'm out of time, yeah. sorry. The, the time is up, but thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Sun, would you like I'll, the chair yeah, back? I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the chair back. So, uh, so that concludes the questions to, uh, uh, to all of you, and we'll be back uh, after uh, uh, the lunch break at 1.30, and we will start with the uh, uh, just hold on. Uh, we will start with uh, Susanna Vero, uh, then uh, David Lynch, Elaine Schultz, Jesse Hawkins, and John Collier. Okay. All right. We'll be see, see you at one thirty.
We are live from City Hall. Councillor Stevenson, can you confirm that you're available online? Yes, I'm here. Are you comfortable starting the meeting as the Deputy Mayor? Yes, happy to. Uh, welcome back to our uh, public hearing process. I'll just ask my um, colleagues to do a quick roll call. Uh, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Paquette. Councillor Paquette. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Councillor, oh, sorry, was that you, Councillor Paquette? No, okay, Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Um, Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Councillor uh, Salvador. Good afternoon. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jams. Oh, I, who I believe is away um, uh, uh, for a, a personal obligation. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Let me know when you want the chair. All right, I'll take the chair back and thank you so much for doing the roll call, Councillor Stevenson. No uh, all right, we're getting, going into our second panel and I will call the names. Uh, Susanna Bureau, please come up here uh, or here, number one, whichever, oh, here, actually, number 13, sorry. Uh, David Lynch, David Lynch. In person, David, we'll call you back. Uh, Elaine Schultz, Jesse Hawkins, joining remotely. Present, joining remotely. Thank you. And John Collier, in person. Okay, well, each of you will have five minutes to uh, make your presentation, and uh, after that, uh, council members may have questions to you. We'll start with uh, uh, Susanna Biro. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and councillors. I wondered whether it might be, so I'm technically the last of the previous um, of the Windsor Park Citizens Coalition speakers I was going to sum up. I don't know if it's possible to go back to those slides, perhaps, for just a moment. Yeah, we can go back to those slides, yeah. Here you go, right up there. Oh, yeah. great, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, if you could go back, um, there's a photo I'd like to go back to uh, that was in my sister's presentation, so a little ways further back. Oh, pardon me, no. Uh, Next, that one. Yes, thank you so much. We'll start your time again, go ahead. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. And good afternoon again to everyone. Thanks for the opportunity of uh, presenting our views on behalf of the Windsor Park community and, and our group of neighbors. I did wanna just go back briefly to this photo that had occurred in my sister's presentation because it speaks so clearly to what is possible, gentle, or friendly densification. There's the Bentley on the left-hand side of the photo. Our two uh, neighbors to the south with their um, garden suites uh, or garage suites that they've put up. And then hulking in the background, you see the West, or, or pardon me, the Windsor Terrace. Um, uh, so the contrast couldn't be more, couldn't be more plain. Um, we really, as you've heard from many of our neighbors, we really, are not opposed to densification, but we want it to be orderly. We want it to be community-minded. We want it to pay attention to the principles that have been set out throughout the government documents. So uh, in summary, um, on behalf of the Windsor Park Citizens Coalition, we support the city plan's densification principles and goals. We support the district's concept. We support the draft district general policy and the draft Skona district plan as the way to implement the principles and goals of the city plan. 
The Westridge proposal does not comply with the principles set out in the City Plan, nor the requirements of the District General Policy and the Scona District Plan. Next slide, please. Or, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> the Westridge proposal places an undue burden on its 117th Street and 118th Street neighbours and the neighbouring school and daycare and a failure to uphold the principles of the city plan and the failure to apply the clear requirements of the district general policy and the Scona district plan will seriously undermine public trust. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. Um, next, I'll call again if David Lynch is here. No, uh, we'll go next to Elaine Schultz. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Soe and councillors. I'm the Civics Director of the Windsor Park Community League and I'll be speaking to the key points in the letter sent on Friday. The League is reasonable and flexible when it comes to increasing density in the neighbourhood. Uh, this rezoning site is located where we would expect to see two and a half storey townhouses or three storey walk-ups built among new and renovated single family homes as the, single, as the city plan is implemented. A six-story building that is 90 meters in length is completely out of scale in this location and has, as you've heard, um, impacts on neighbors, both institutional neighbors and uh, residents. Photos have been uh, provided about the uh, properties that will be impacted. And we know, uh, as our letter did, that a large number of objections summarized in the What We Heard report focused on the location. Uh, the Windsor Park Community League Executive unanimously approved a motion in January to oppose this DC2 rezoning because of its unsuitable location and related impacts. Given Windsor Park's location near the university, we certainly expect to see more buildings developed that contain units suitable for students. At the same time, we don't want to lose our character as a neighborhood for all stages of life. Because we lack housing that's affordable for young families, the League's focus over the past decade or so has been to encourage more family-friendly, higher-density developments, from duplexes to stacked row housing. So far, we've seen very little in the way of family-friendly, multi-use unit housing forms. We have one semi-detached development in the neighborhood, and one lot was rezoned a year ago for a, count for a corner row house development. But in contrast with this, with at least five dozen new infill single family homes over the past 20 years or so. Windsor Terrace under construction will have three three bedroom units out of 139. And this rezoning will have six out of 172 for a total of nine family friendly units out of a total of 357 units across four multi-unit buildings. That's a mere 2.5 percent. We're particularly interested in seeing family-friendly housing built on this site because it is directly across from Windsor Park School, which includes a daycare, and across from the community hall where a preschool is located. For reference, uh, examples of row housing and stacked row housing are in the package of photos. We calculate that 24 such family-friendly housing units could be built on either side of the skinnies that are on the site for a total of 26 family-friendly units on those properties, along with secondary and garden suites for a total of 55 units altogether. When the developer indicated he wanted to put a six-story development on the three lots he purchased south of the Skinnies and wasn't interested in row housing, we even suggested a combo building with two-story ground-oriented town townhouse-style units in a podium at the base and a couple of stories of smaller apartments set back from all sides above the podium. And, you know, th these suggestions have gone nowhere. Um, a second major focus of the League has been to work to ensure, to work with the developer and administration to ensure higher density developments fit into the community and don't unduly impact neighbors or the community overall. Once the pre-application process started on this DC2 application last summer for a six-story building on a larger seven 
property site, the Community League has focused on suggesting changes that would reduce its impact. First, we wanted to shrink the project's size. For height, we proposed a five-story building, about 17 and a half meters, that transitioned down to three stories, about 10 and a half meters. Once we realized it might be possible to move rather than demolish the two new skinny houses that are in the middle of the site, we suggested moving them a short distance to the north and incorporating them into the project. Um, and the photos of the skinny houses are provided. This would reduce the length of the multi-unit building to about 75 meters. Reducing the height would reduce the number of units and so would reducing the length of the building. We also propose eliminating uses that would create additional traffic and parking issues on an already busy street, such as childcare, live work units, and major home businesses. The removal of these uses and 10% limit on studio units and the slight reduction in height from 23 meters to 20 don't sufficiently reduce the overwhelming size of this project and there was no reduction in the number of units that remains at 172. I am sorry, Elaine. That's fine. The uh, <laughs> next person will pick up where I left off. Okay, no worries. Thank you so much. Uh, Jesse Hawkins. Hi, Mayor Sovi. Uh, hi, members of council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Windsor Park Community League in support of the residents most affected by the proposed development. Um, in closing from Elaine's remarks, the location is indeed inappropriate for a project of this size, and we urge council to turn down this rezoning. For my piece, I will start with a quick introduction. Uh, my wife and I, we purchased an original 1942 built home in Windsor Park about six years ago and we've been living there and improving it ever since. Very shortly after we moved in, the property next to us was purchased, the lot was subdivided, houses were built and listed for sale. Uh, for five years the house neighboring ours has been unsold and unoccupied, but for each of those five years I've shoveled the sidewalks, I've managed the sandy lines and I will continue to do so as a courtesy to the community and to keep the unused property reasonably attractive to potential owners. I, I mentioned this only to convey that in me, you have a homeowner who's willing to do his part and more to make densification work. Even if it's indeed my own home that's affected, I'm, I'm here to make these plans successful to see that reasonable compromises can be reached. So I want you to know that in me, you have an ally, but one who also empathizes with those whose homes are affected by these decisions. And it is on that basis, speaking for the Community League on behalf of my neighbors, that I do submit that the height, length, and unit count of this proposal are indeed inappropriate for its location. Um, since the pre-application process started last summer uh, for the six-story proposal on seven property site, the Community League has proposed compromises that would reduce its impact on the affected residents. For height, Many of the residents' concerns have been spoken to. They're valid, but I won't repeat them. I will add that the Community League has proposed alternatives, even as large as a five-story building transitioning to a three-story, having a maximum height of 17.5 meters. Um, these have not been given meaningful consideration. The proposal before us today is six stories tall, 20 meters high, the full 170 plus unit. For length, Residential infill guidelines recommend multifamily buildings no longer than 48 meters. The current proposal is 90 meters, nearly double the guideline. It requires the demolition of two new infill homes built within the last 10 years. The Community League has inquired as to whether these new homes could be integrated in the plan, perhaps in fact, even be relocated to the lot at the north end of the developer's footprint and resold. This would reduce the length of the development to about 75 meters and improve its easement into the neighborhood. Again, uh, this was given no meaningful consideration. And, and this is honestly how neighbors and potential allies of development become opponents. So for location, the proposed location on a residential street opposite an elementary school is inappropriate in our eyes. Major multifamily developments have been built and are indeed being built within Windsor Park 
in locations better able to accommodate the new and the existing residents. And Windsor Park is a neighborhood that will continue to accommodate and support such developments if they are indeed properly sited. There are collector roads along the full length of the neighborhood east periphery. The very same roads that were presented just before lunch as the major node boundary. The west periphery along Grote Road, the south periphery along University Avenue, and 87th Avenue, which fully bisects the neighborhood, are all equipped with frontage roads to provide safer accesses to higher density developments. 118th Street, in this case, is a residential road with parking along the east curb lane in front of the residences and loading zones along the west for users of the school, the daycare and the preschool. This is consistent with the unique needs of that space, but is different from the other residential roads within the neighborhood, for which parking is limited to one side of the street. Because of our residential road widths, including 118th Street are nine meters. This is, according to the Edmonton Complete Streets Guideline, the minimum width required for safe two-way traffic with vehicles parked on both sides. And in this case, with consideration that the road faces an elementary school, a daycare, a preschool, it is not the appropriate location for a traffic increase from a proposal which moves from seven residences to 170 plus residences on the same footprint. So on the basis of height, length and location, on behalf of the Community League and the community members most affected by the decision, with no meaningful consideration made on the part of the developer for the community's concerns, we do encourage council to turn down this rezoning. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, next, we will go to John Collier. Thank you, Mayor Sohi and councillors. I've cut my presentation down because we don't need repetition. First, I want to talk about density. In the administration report, Windsor Park is described as a low density community. And that's largely true. Not mentioned in this report is the fact that within 350 meters of this proposed development, there are 2,300 student residences. That said, we agree that Windsor Park needs to densify. It does not, however, mean that we want or in, in any conceivable world need more bachelor and one bedroom units, of which this proposed development is going to add 86. What we need, and quite desperately in fact, we've been asking this for years, every time we come before council, is affordable family housing. This is an absolutely ideal site for family housing, what with it being close to a major employment center, across from a park, a playground, and a school. It's a poor choice for even more bachelor and one bedroom units. And I also want to re-emphasize impact. This project is massive. It's nigh on a hundred meters wide, sweet, Mother of Pearl, that's the size of the Jubilee Auditorium. This development doesn't blend in, it stuns and stupefies you. We've all had this epiphany. We've been walking down the street, looked up and realized that stripes at a certain point are no longer slimming. Recesses and paint do not reduce mass. If you actually want to reduce mass, you don't make one large building with stripes. Instead, you make one building into two or three and have actual space between them. The people on 117th already have the Bentley and the Windsor Terrace affecting them. Both of these projects, Elaine and I supported and worked with the developers to enhance the community by adding missing housing types and spaces for retail and services. Have a look at the shadow studies in the uh, administration report. The people on the south end of 117th have lost both their south and southwest sun to the Bentley and the Windsor Terrace developments. Now this will take away their sun from the west. Administration writes that this is the cost of urbanization. 
I suppose so if this was the last possible development site in Windsor Park. But why are we building all of Windsor Park's densification on one area of one block? There are 3.6 kilometers of arterials and collector roads in Windsor Park. Some of them even have service roads. These affected residents, they've done their part. They've lost their south and southwest sun. By all means, do build this project in Windsor Park, but not on this site. Smart densification is spread around a neighborhood. Smart densification enhances a community, not destroys a part of it. We ask that you refuse this application and that the developer either reapplies with a location on an arterial or a collector road or on this same site with a multi-building design of no more than four stories and at least 50% family-friendly units. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your presentation. I will call once again if David Lee Lynch is present, virtually or in person. Seeing one, two, three. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for your presentation. Now we will go to questions from Council. Okay. Councilor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sophie, and thanks to everyone for speaking. I, I, uh, I really do appreciate the time. I wanted to chat with Ms. Solez and Mr. Collier because I, I remember the 2015 discussion, and I, I, I'm not sure you made a lot of friends uh, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I appreciated that, that you did share a different position than maybe others who had attended that. Uh, but maybe, Ms. Solez, I want to start with you, and, and the question will probably come to you, Mr. Collier, as well. Um, one of the struggles I'm dealing with and, and hearing some of the initial presentations is you mentioned a compromise that actually sounds quite reasonable, you know, five stories down to three, um, with some different design pieces. I'm not sure, based off what I heard in the first panel, that that is necessarily a universal perspective. Um, I, I have, you know, I heard a lot of folks who said row housing or less. So I guess I wanted to pose the first question to you, Ms. Solis, because I know you've been in this, doing this for years and years and years, not just in Windsor Park, but through EFCL and all of that. Why is that, in your mind, reasonable, and, and how does that maybe help address the concerns of the current application? Well, it would be less impact than the current proposal. And no, not everybody is going to love it, but I think that if it were changed in that way, that it would be tolerated. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly going down to four and three stories as it transitions to the north, and uh, five stories would be no higher than the Bentley. The Bentley is four stories with high ceilings and, and raised out of the ground. So that's sort of kind of the, the benchmark I'm, I'm uh, thinking about. Uh, and it isn't our preferred. Our preferred would be the row housing and stacked row housing and, and keeping the skinnies where they are. Sure. Yeah, and, and the reason I do ask is because, you know, part of when I supported the city plan is that I, I don't think, you know, and this is a struggle, I realize, as someone who also lives in a mature neighborhood, that I don't think every apartment or condo building should be relegated to the edges of communities. I do think we do need to start allowing different types of built form in the communities. And so it sounds like you presented something uh, interesting. Ms. Mr. Collier, do you want to, you spoke a little bit to that about, you know, there's even some collector roads in the community. And do you want to touch on that idea and that concept? Well, we uh, agree with you completely, actually. Um, but we think inside the community, they, there needs to be some context and, and sympathy given to the immediate neighbors. Mm -hmm. And this is why when we spoke to the developer initially, we said, you know, you can build to four stories and we think that will be okay because, you know, it reduces uh, sunlight and other impacts and things like that. We didn't start out with we only want RF1. We started out that, you know, four stories and that we wanted family. The, the main thing we wanted was family-oriented development because it's really expensive in our neighborhood. 
So, and the new zoning that's proposed, and we'll wait and see what's coming, is, is going to be low density zoning, and that's going to include, I believe, up to three, maybe four, I don't know, but three anyways, and that'll just be automatic, and away we go. And we fully support that sort of uh, densification in our neighborhood 100%. And we also acknowledge that properties in our neighborhood are not inexpensive, and so when you accumulate a bunch of them, uh, you know, you, you, you can't put up a, 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 you know, simple just row housing and recoup all your expenses without making it Cadillac and, and gold. Yeah. So, you know, four-story stacked row housing we thought was reasonable. And again, you can take the same, let's say it was uh, uh, rumors of about $10 million, and buy properties along the service or arterial roads where the bulk of the effect is on the poor vehicle drivers who, and then interior residences are only affected on one side. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Solis? Um, I would yeah. uh, just add to uh, what I said before and what John has currently said is that um, to your point about putting uh, higher density within communities as opposed to only on the edge, 87th Avenue isn't on the edge of our community. It goes right through the middle of it. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're not talking edge, <laughs> ed edge here. Fair point. Um, yeah. Yeah. Neighborhood edge. It is an arterial road, so Correct. it has that characteristic. Uh, but we're, um, we are open to things within the, the neighborhood and, and the, the urban mix in the district general policy draft. Uh, we're, we're expecting that, you know, the, the three-story walk-up thing. We, what we don't want is a whole lot of three-story mansions, single-family mansions, <laughs> which, is, you know, is the other thing we <clears throat> tend to get in our neighborhood. <laughs> but, uh, we, you know, we, if it were a three-story walk-up with, you know, six mm -hmm. to eight units or so, it would, that would be six to, six to eight families as opposed to two people rattling around in a, in a huge house. All right, another time. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilor Nack. Councilor Wright. Thank you. Um, you'd mentioned there was 2,300 other student housing options available. Um, are those available or are they all rented or? Uh, that would be, list, that's all the Lister Hall complex. Okay. So it varies as to whether a building is under renovation. So I've seen it as low as 1,700. They've also built a new building. I believe it's up around 2,300, so it floats around. And my point is just that we may look like a low density community, and to a certain extent we are, but we have a lot of people that live in that low density community that aren't counted by the city. Okay, because they're just students there? Uh, yes, they're, 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 uh, they're yeah. students there, okay. yeah. Okay, um, and then you also mentioned that it's not necessarily affordable um, to buy in, in your community. So how, if you were to reduce the numbers from uh, what the proponent's asking for to uh, three or four story townhouses and that, how affordable would that still be? It's going to be a lot more affordable than what we have in our neighborhood right now. Uh, I realize that we're very unlikely to get down to the levels of what might be con considered low income housing. I, I understand that unless we put in some kind of subsidy program, which I wouldn't necessarily oppose. But right now, affordable in our neighborhood is, is far too close to a million dollars. And if you can get that down to three or 400,000, or I, I actually believe these properties are slated to be rentals, not that that's an issue at the council today, and it's not that it's an issue for us. So I'm not sure how that works out in rents because I'm not sure of current rents, but it's going to be cheaper than what we presently have. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Sorry, Ms. Ms. Barrow, you, I saw you kind of nodding your head, I think, when the, the suggestion was made for um, the, the lower density. Is, is that something that the coalition would support as well? I, I believe so. I, I, um, I know that most of the concerns had to do with the location of a building, a behemoth building of this size. Uh, so lower density, um, or not lower density, but lower <laughs> housing, um, and particularly family units, family-sized units, three-bedroom units. Um, we would absolutely love that. I, I think I'm 
fair to say that. Okay, coalition. <laughs> <laughs> I know, putting you in a tough position asking you to speak on behalf of everyone. Um, and, and is it Ms. Solas or Souls? Solas. Solas. Um, so you said you, you proposed this um, to the proponents and their reaction was? Uh, well, at the time we proposed, we'd had meetings with them initially and then once it became part of the standard pre-application application process, it was written communication and, and that sort of thing. But uh, the response we see in the, the revised uh, bylaw, uh, we saw uh, some of the response in the first draft of the bylaw and more uh, and then a greater response in the, in the final. The changes that were made had to do with um, uh, removing certain uses that we don't necessarily object to generally, but would object to in that location because they generate more traffic, um, you know, like live work units and major home businesses and that and childcare, yes. right? Uh, we don't object to those in our neighborhood. We would object to them in that location, and they were removed, and we we do acknowledge that. And there was a limitation put on the studio units, that, and we we appreciate that and we acknowledge that, but that doesn't change the height. It doesn't change the number of units overall, and those are the big, the big things that uh, remain and uh, there obstacles. Was, there was no us. other rationale or anything provided directly to you as to why they didn't want to change. Uh, those well, things? it was lower, reducing the impact, and we only we can only assume it's a, it's a financial decision. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. Want to follow up with uh, Jesse Hawkins uh, about your three uh, compromises that you proposed? If I understood you correctly, uh, on height going from twenty meter to seventeen and a half meters across the the project or you want it scaled back as it's proposed now from 20 to 17 and a half, then 14.5? Yeah, I'm speaking on behalf of the community league on these, but that was worth mentioning just because it really demonstrated where the line was drawn in terms of a an openness to compromise with the community league on behalf of the residents most affected. Um, the project as proposed retains those two elements uh, that favor the developer, the unit count, the height, the stories, hmm. um, but they haven't shown meaningful compromise okay. with but, the community league. So, but what was community's, community's proposal was 17 and a half meters? That was sort of our, the closest we'd offered uh, to approach within their original plan. But that, that would yeah. also mean in areas where it's proposed to be 17 and a half meters, that will go further down by another two meters, right? So is that how you, you, you see it going scaled down, right? That's right. Okay, got it. The, the maximum height was 17 and a half, and, got, and that was got, unacceptable for the proposal, well, the proposal of 20 meters. And on the length, you said 48 meters, right? Uh, 48 is the, is the maximum recommended by the residential infill guidelines. Current proposal is 90 meters. Yeah, uh, we were looking for ways to shorten that and save the the two brand new infill homes uh, that are right now part of the demolition scope. Oh, I see. Um, so again, it we would love to see those homes. Okay, and the saved, num and number of number of units. Sorry, what was your proposal or your compromise? Uh, it's just it's the same message as as the others on behalf of the community. More multifamily units, uh, simply to make that our neighborhood more broadly accessible. Um, to families uh, and and those driving the diversity that the developer mentioned in their presentation. Okay, so more than six that is being proposed, uh, three bedroom family yes. oriented dwelling units, right? But uh, two 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 bedroom could also be. So what is how do you how do you how do you make that distinction? Well, the more the better. On our part. Could I jump in uh -huh. here? <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead, Lenny. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's my understanding that the definition of a family-friendly unit is three bedrooms. That, yes, families do live in two-bedroom units, but it's um, a tight squeeze. It's often okay. a, a single parent and one kid. You yeah. know, that, that sort of thing. It, it's, um, 
I think even the city considers uh, yeah. three bedroom units. So community would prefer more unit. three bedroom. Yeah, and in terms of overall number of units, we didn't really have a specified number, but we just figured if the whole thing came down uh, one one full story, that it would probably reduce the number of units. Yeah. By so a bring quarter. reducing the height and reducing the length will definitely reduce the number of units. Yeah, unless you make everybody living in a rabbit warren, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yes, that, that would be true. And that probably links to affordability issue that Councillor Wright was asking earlier on, right? So how do you how do you balance that? That's something that we will ask proponent on. That could I think too you have to think about is it short term return or is it return over a longer period of time? Um, uh, that that also factors in into Got this. It. Good. All right. Well, thank you once again for uh, all of you for participating. Very, very informed presentations that uh, you have prepared. I'm, I'm sure you spend hours and hours of uh, putting this together. So really appreciate that community involvement and uh, the way community feels uh, that they are uh, empowered. Right. Good. All right. I'll take the chair back. You're sorry. I'm sorry, Jesse, did I miss, miss something? Okay, good. All right, so that concludes the questions. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, at this time, we will go to uh, our administration for questions. All right, Councilor Nack, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. So uh, wanted to, I think that one of the big questions that I'm struggling with a bit, because uh, I've heard the compromise, and I think that's an interesting idea, but but I, one of the parts that I think in the presentation that jumped out at me is the Scona district plan piece and the draft district plan. And can you talk a bit about that, appreciating that, yes, it's a draft plan, but it doesn't seem to suggest that this is a site that would be, we'd be looking at this type of building on. Yes, thank you for the question, Councillor. Uh, yeah, it is a draft plan. Um, the work being done on district planning is uh, still very much ongoing. Um, in this case, we very strongly feel that the district plan is in the current draft state should not be a major factor in, in this application. Um, they are very early drafts. Um, they haven't, these are the versions that hadn't gone through any public engagement, any touch points with council. Uh, there's very meaningful revisions in the works as it was alluded to by the, the January motion. Um, so we are not considering those to be major factors in this. We considered them relative to the extent that we know what they say. Um, and uh, you're correct in the sense that the current draft um, would not show this site as being within that major node. Um, but that's not something that we consider um, a final decision. Mm -hmm. And so we're basing our recommendation on uh, the city plan. And, and I would also say that, I mean, if you are looking at the current drafts, um, when you look at the wording there, it's directing where support should happen. It's not saying where other sites can't be considered. Um, and so I think we're always gonna have situations where um, the obvious ones where it says very clearly to support, and then we're gonna have ones that are gonna be a little bit away from that that we have to deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, and, and I very much appreciate that. And, and I know it's, like I say, it's always a work in progress. And I guess I struggle because that that is, you know, I appreciate that from a planning perspective, we might not use that heavily. From a community perspective, it's not seen in the same way. I mean, I, I st how many times even just today was the residential infill guidelines referenced? And I think realistically, we don't really use those anymore, you know, since the city plan came in. But but I know communities have used those documents as a, as a bit of what they can point to to say, this is how I can visualize it and understand it. And I would also add, you know, the early drafts were made available specifically so that we could do early public engagement, mm -hmm. right? And that's Absolutely. the main reason. Um, it becomes challenging for us to do early engagement if there's an expectation that those early drafts need to be considered um, to the extent that some people are suggesting that they are. Yeah. Um, but I guess where, where the piece comes to this is that for any number of reasons through the, the thoughtful work that has gone into them thus far, it was in the initial draft suggested that this would not be a location that we were originally thinking. Of. And again, appreciate that you said that it's not a it's not a hard and fast rule that if it's outside of the box that, that you would never consider it. But but some some sequence of events took place that for the first draft 
this was an area that we were less likely to point to. And that's where, and I think that's where I think the, the, the challenge is. No, agreed. And I think uh, through our analysis of the city plan, we also recognize that it's, it's not in uh, the center of the node as well. Yeah. Um, and the same would occur for the, the district plan. Uh, if we were to include that analysis, that would, it's recognized that it's not within it, but it's definitely within the influence of it, which is that edge condition. Um, and our recommendation is based off of uh, that interpretation of, of policy and best practice and how we've seen how multifamily developments uh, can work around uh, parks and open spaces in other existing mature communities. It does it quite well. North Glenora is a great example of that. Um, and it brings a different element in vitality to the community. Um, and in, in conjunction with the direct control that allows uh, very specific con, uh, regulation of the built form, uh, and that's what our recommendation is on. But yeah, just to be yeah. clear that we also, we, we unequivocally uh, state that yes, it's not in uh, the node itself, but it's on that edge, uh, which is subject to its influence. And, and from a city plan perspective, because I, I, I don't necessarily agree with as much as I heard from the speakers today that the city plan would not at all suggest that this is a site. Generally speaking, the city plan looks at things like, you know, even though there's specific nodes, and, uh, I'm going to be out of time. I'm going I'm to respect you can, the time. You can process. come back for I a second, will. Ron. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I might loop back to some of those questions as well. Uh, but just to start off, how does Windsor Park's density um, currently compare to what we'd expect in a new neighbourhood? So, Councillor, it's about half of the minimum requirements for a new neighbourhood. So we're looking, or, or less, and this is where it depends on, you know, exactly what numbers you're using. Uh, in our report, we use the 2016 federal census data because that's the the data that's mo most fully distilled down and workable. Um, and whether you go with that or some more recent uh, numbers from 2021, we're looking at about 10 to 14 uh, dwelling units per net residential hectare, which is um, at least half of what would be expected for a new neighborhood. Okay, so even if we're being really, you know, um, if, we're, if we're including some of those more recent numbers or assessments, that's, that would still be below what we'd expect in a new neighborhood? Yes, Council. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, looking at uh, growth management framework, some of the priority growth areas were mentioned today, um, and a lot of my questions are going to be around lines, lines on maps and what exactly those lines mean and whether those lines are solid walls or whether they are gradients. And um, yeah, when I look at the priority growth areas, there's, of course, a line drawn, but is the expectation that uh, there is sort of a degree of influence that those priority growth areas would have on adjacent blocks, maybe a block or two. Yes, Councillor, I think uh, when we're talking about these uh, very specific lines and, you know, at some point through the district planning process, we're going to have lines drawn probably down a road uh, between uh, nodes and corridors. Um, when the final policies are done in, with respect to what sort of intensity of development should happen in those, um, there's probably going to need to be some, um, you know, uh, development on both sides of that. And, and th so that's where we go into the transitions. And so I know that the, you know, if you were looking at it and you might say in or out of the major node, but that edge condition, uh, we definitely would want to have be some form of transition. And that's where we see this application as uh, it's not the high rise that you might expect in the major node. Um, and it's not quite you know, row housing or, or uh, that you might expect uh, a good distance away, but it's in that transition and it's an appropriate yeah. scale for that. How are we working to make those transition, it's a funny question, because uh, it's transition zone, but we need to make it more clear um, that, that there's a certain degree of flexibility and great gradation, is that a word? Um, there's a gradient in what people should be expecting to see. Because I feel like that's that's where we start to see um, concerns around public trust because people assume that it's gonna be a hard line when it's actually more of a transition zone. How how are we working to address that? So Councillor, through that district planning process, uh, that is a question that we're grappling with right now. Um, just to keep in mind though that both the district plan and the city plan are planning at a citywide scale, um, which goes to your point that importance of when you do draw a line, it's not drawing a line with precision uh, because of that necessary uh, vagueness when you are planning uh, through the district plans a whole city in itself. Uh, so 
through that district plan policy, there, there is going to be uh, that discussion uh, in terms of today and how it relates to today's application. Uh, we believe that within the city plan, uh, there is that broad direction to direct growth uh, and intensification to these major nodes. Uh, the Garneau University node is the biggest node in the city. Um, and to expect that influence to end at the street that the university is, um, whether that's 116th or what have you, uh, I think is an unrealistic expectation. Um, and I think that has to be built into that policy framework. Great, thank you. Um, one quick one and then I might come back. Uh, what's family friendly housing? So we don't currently have a definition and the zoning bylaw for that. Um, what we do is we look at um, the contribution policy and that lists some options for criteria. Uh, we do at a minimum ask for three bedrooms and then the developer typically chooses from a list of other uh, options that could include enhanced storage, bicycle parking, um, and various other things. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Stevenson. Yes, thanks. I'll, I'll pick up right there, actually. Um, I know that three bedroom units is something that we, we look for in any of our family development, um, but the, there are challenges and barriers to providing that. Uh, so I believe that we, we actually made a motion for administration to come back and, and tell us um, some strategies about how we make that easier again for all developments which isn't unique to this site. Is that the case? That there'll be a report coming back? There is a report coming back, that's correct. Uh, so right now what we have, as Andrew noted, was the community amenity contribution policy and how we, uh, I guess, use, use that as a guide in terms of what it use, what, it, what three bedrooms or family oriented units are. Uh, in terms of that definition and how it, it applies to that community amenity contribution, which is a three bedrooms plus different types of amenities that are commonly used by families, such as increased storage, uh, play areas, et cetera. Great. Um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding correctly. Um, there is a, a requirement in the zone that is it 50% of all units have to be two bedrooms or more. Is that correct? That's correct. So that, I mean, that that seems very substantial to me in terms of providing, again, a mix, um, a really solid mix of, of units. And as someone raising a family in a two bedroom, you know, I think that that does create some opportunities for families as well. Um, you know, maybe also just, just clarifying as well that it's not atypical for high density to be located around um, school sites as well. And the Holy Child school site, the Oliver school site, those have considerably more density uh, immediately around the school sites. Is that correct? That's correct. It's a very common uh, thing to see around the city, both in infill locations and in suburban locations. Um, Oliver, North Glenora was mentioned, uh, McQueen, Pleasant View, Park Allen, Hazel Dean, Strathcona by King Edward School. These all have uh, some form of multifamily around the open space. And uh, in suburban examples, it's typical because uh, there's often collector roads that carry um, large utilities that can also serve larger development. So it's a very common thing throughout the city. Great. Um, there is a regulation that notes that uh, ground oriented units will require individual entrances, uh, which I think really speaks to that sort of um, uh, row house, brownstone, walk up sort of street feel. Just looking at the elevation, though, it seems to me that what's being shown is is more like the patio sliding door. But I just want to confirm that that is the, just, I just wanna make sure that the language of the regulation would take precedence over the, the elevations that are provided as visuals, as appendices. And that we would see individual entrances, doors uh, with a proper ground oriented entrance. That's correct, yeah. The, the text saying sliding patio doors shall not serve as the entrance to these dwellings would take precedence over any of the, Appendices. The appendices are meant to show a general uh, uh, depiction of the building, and uh, the development printer stage will have more detailed building drawings, and they'll have to conform with that text. Great, excellent. You know, my colleagues have spoken to sort of the idea of, you know, the the fuzziness of some of the boundaries. I just want to pick up on another idea around um, the pace of change or the the pace of um, phased growth. And, you know, I think that when we think about change over time, it's sort of this idea that it's a linear, you know, steady, steady growth. Um, but is it true that our experience is typically that, that development comes and starts and stops? It's given the realities of land assembly, of individual property owners planning to redevelop? 
Councillor, that's correct. Uh, development is, is definitely not linear, uh, nor is our growth management strategy. It recognizes that asymmetrical notion of it. Um, some places will it'll accelerate, some may not go as fast as others. Uh, so it's definitely not a, a clear line. Uh, and to be just reflecting on, on what one of the graphs that you might be talking about from uh, the public's presentation, there were the, the notion that Windsor Park uh, and this development would soak up all of its uh, development need for the, I guess, the entire duration of city plan uh, is a little bit misleading in the fact that uh, even at the district Scona plan, we're, we're looking at roughly about a 30% increase from that one to 1.25 million threshold of the of the existing residents. So there, it's definitely, a, as you know, mentioned, uh, it comes in steps, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that one one neighborhood can be complete in that uh, process. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Wright. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm just trying to get back to the slide on the uh, density. Um, so in the, what's provided in the report, um, I think it was nine point something um, based on the 2016 figures and that's without Windsor Terrace included? Dwellings per hectares? What, what would that number be with Windsor Terrace included on 2021 stats? So that gets us up to about 20, uh, sorry, if, including Windsor Terrace and this development, if approved, yes, yes, sorry. Um, would, would get us to about that uh, 20. Okay, which is which on is par with newer developments? No, new that's still about half. Or yeah, new neighbourhoods are required about 45, about 45 dwellings hectare. Okay. okay, so we're, we're still way off the mark there. Okay, um, and then, oh, and does that include then the, is it the Lister Hall um, towers as well? No, those are not included within the stats for Windsor Park. Okay, and what would that be then? Would it be part of the university lands is where those those would be considered. And that's not considered as part of the, within the Windsor Park? No. Area, okay. Um, okay, and then Mr. Johnson, can you maybe provide a legal opinion on the, um, on the case law that Mr. Shores referenced? Uh, I'd be happy to, Councillor. Okay. So I, I don't disagree with the cases he cited. We don't usually discuss actual case names and okay. <laughs> particulars in here, but the notion is sound. Uh, what are, where we probably disagree is on what treatment would be given to this particular statutory plan. In the case law that was cited, usually um, from the ones I've read, those are ones that have already gone to two readings at Council. One of them is where it's waiting for the EMRB to give approval of it. There's some level of indication that's been vetted by the Council of the day in those, in those situations. So yes, it is a valid planning consideration for you to look to. What I would advise is be careful how much weight you give that in this instance on such a changing document that hasn't transpired to a form that is even before council yet. The other thing I'd offer is I, I do know you have legal counsel for the applicant. You may wish to get their opinion on as well since he hasn't had a chance to weigh in on that. Okay, all right, thank you very much then. That's all I have. All oh, right. actually, can I go to the applicant? Oh, not no, not yet, delayed. not yet, okay. not yeah. yet. That will come. Patience, uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I do have one question on page 12 on uh, the report. Uh, the contribution from developer and for $375,000, that's for the community amenity infrastructure improvement. So. My question is for this over 375,000 is only uh, sponsored by developer or is there any sheer cost and for the city to improve uh, that community amenities infrastructure? And I know the proposal and uh, indicated the two sidewalks and all, two crosswalks and one sidewalks and behind the school. So can you provide a little bit more detail on that? Yes, Councillor. Uh, those contributions would be entirely paid for by the developer. There'd be no city funds going towards those. Okay, so uh, how's that lumber come from? Is that, la that lumber sufficient and to support the community amenities? The, the number, um, so first we calculate what the required contribution amount is as per the policy, and that's based on how much of a 
increase in development rights that they're seeking through the rezoning. And once we determine that, it's up to the applicant or developer to uh, decide what kinds of contributions they want to make. Uh, in this case, in response to some of the concerns from uh, the community, uh, it was decided that they wanted to contribute some uh, improvements toward those sidewalks and crosswalks. And so then we went through a process uh, at the city to come up with estimations on what those would cost and to make sure that uh, the policy is satisfied. But at the end of the day, what they will be required to do is build those things, regardless of what the actual cost of it are. Okay, so, and so from the speakers from the community, we heard very clear the concern about uh, the school, the traffic, uh, the safety concerns, and those this compromise, and for the sponsor, or address those concerns or so what is specific I just try to get better understanding on that sure counselor <clears throat> the mitigation measures that are part of the DC2 the improvements that have been uh, highlighted are directly coming from the technical review and uh, uh, multiple site visits uh, uh, and in discussions with safe mobility team so those recommendations are included uh, through all that process okay Thank you for that safe mobility team. So my next question, I would like to go back to that growth management. Uh, so on the fifth, on page 15, 15 of the presentation from our speakers indicated that very clear, and it's for the current growth, uh, Windsor Park is 32.1%. And then with this new development, we will up to this 64.1% percent then my question is uh, from our growth management framework do we have a specific time nine uh, for this city so I understand as a 50 percent in the mature neighborhoods that is our average number and is there any specific time nine and for us to grow from certain number to certain number and also do you have that average number compared to other uh, neighborhoods cross city so growth management and, and the city plan took a different tact in terms of measuring how the city grows. Uh, in the past, it, it was in those very logical 10 years, 20 years, et cetera. Uh, instead, it's looking at population thresholds. Uh, so 1.25, 1.5, 1.75, 1 and 2 million. Uh, there, isn't, there isn't a timeline in between those targets that uh, needs to be met. So it, it isn't in 10 years we're going to hit uh, 1.25 million. Um, the notion being is that it'll eventually get there and here's how the steps that we need to do in order to get to these thresholds um, of the population thresholds, not necessarily to make it achievable within 5, 10, 15 years, etc. Uh, so there isn't a specific density targets for any of the neighbor, new, any of the existing neighborhoods uh, other than uh, the notion uh, that 50 percent of the new units at two million need to be included in the existing city itself um, within the Hende, Anthony Hende. Uh, based on the current growth trends, uh, do, do you have that estimate number and when will achieve that $1.25 million dollars population? I, I don't have that information. Uh, what I do have is that uh, right now the Skona district itself is about uh, 57,000 um, and the modeling that is being done to reach that 1.25 million there needs to be an additional 18 to 19,000 people okay th thank you I will come back I have some question to the to the developers as well. of course thank you Councillor Rice Councillor Stevenson can you take the chair please I have the chair thank you so Lister Hall is not included in uh, Windsor Park because it's uh, on university lands even though it's within the Windsor Park neighborhood? Uh, within the, the boundaries that are made for the neighborhood or for the stats collection is not considered part of the Windsor Park neighborhood. Okay, because I'm looking at the map and it does show the other side of 87th as part of Windsor Park, but maybe I'm not reading it properly, but that's, it um, goes to Saskatchewan, it goes to University Avenue, right? Uh, so, so there's, uh, if you're maybe looking at the maps um, that are available online, there's a difference between the boundaries for the neighborhood and for the community league. Could that oh, okay, maybe I'm looking at The community at league that. Uh, boundary typically does include the university, um, but okay. we don't use that for yeah. the neighborhood boundary. So when we look at the overall neighborhood density, 
we looking at the overall broader neighborhood? Are we looking at kind of geographical areas? If communities argument is that this this site includes two other high high density buildings, and you add this one, right? Uh, do we kind of localize numbers, or uh, we just look at the overall broad um, broad numbers uh, in the in the context of the neighborhood? I think in this specific instance, uh, we look at what is available and how stats are collected. Uh, Lister Hall is not. Yep. Included in any type of unit calculation in any census tract. Um, it's labeled as a, a university residence. Yeah. Uh, so it has a little different um, connotation to it. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is that uh, within this site, close to this site, uh, there are two other uh, uh, high rise buildings, right? So if you put three together, uh, within that geographical area and the small area, not the entire community. We don't go into that kind of granular, granular uh, analysis, right? No, we do not. Okay, got it. Uh, did you have any conversations with the, the proponent uh, or uh, on community su suggestions about reducing the height, reducing the number of units, and uh, you know, reducing the number, number of length or maybe having two buildings uh, uh, on on the same block, right? But uh, have uh, have a um, you know separation. Uh, yes, Mayor, we did uh, have a lot of conversations with the applicant about that. Um, fortunately, through our public engagement activities, we received a lot of ideas, and that was great uh, from the community league, from the coalition, and from individuals. And so, whenever we get that kind of feedback, we always look to the applicant and and have discussions with them about what they want to try and change um, to address those concerns. Um, and you know. There's some things that they that they were willing to change and, and some things that they weren't. But we definitely had the discussion. Okay. So can you give me some rationale for not like if the uh, if the heights were to be changed from uh, say 20 meter to 17 and a half, then further down two meters as uh, uh, move to move to north, right? Have you have has developer given you any indication what are the reasons that they cannot do that? Or I, I'll ask that question to the. Uh, to the proponent as well, but have you had that kind of conversation? What impact would it have on the project? Uh, we have not had a very specific conversation about um, exactly what the reasons for saying no to some things or yes to others, um, but I, I think it's probably best that they okay. um, answer that question about their rationale. Okay. But in, in, like in our facilitation of uh, that community dialogue, do does the administration play that kind of mediatory or facilitating role to bring parties together, like? So Council, this, the, or sorry, Mayor. Um, no it's, it's a little different uh, process uh, than say a city project uh, where city administration holds the pen uh, or the ability to change the project itself. Uh, so within the, the planning process, uh, our engagement uh, seeks uh, a number of different things, but mainly it's to seek that local perspective uh, it's to make sure the neighborhoods are inf or neighbors are informed of the okay. process uh, and then ultimately present that feedback uh, to council so that they can oh, take okay. that into consideration. Okay. So uh, you don't mediate, say, you know, from maybe from 17 and a half to 18, right? You don't do that kind of work, right? Uh, we uh, definitely work with the applicant yeah. based on the community's concerns to see where they can move, um, but, but it's not necessarily okay, applicant, do this and you get our support um, because our evaluation is based on the, the policy at hand, um, not necessarily the, the community feedback. Okay, got it, okay. All right, uh, I will take the chair back and I'll go to Councillor Rice next. Oh, sorry, uh, I'll, I'll keep, hold on, Councillor Stevenson, keep, keep on taking the chair. Uh, I will move the second round. Second. Thank you. Uh, please vote. Wait, is there a second? Yeah, Councilor. We have all the votes. Display the please votes, display please. Display the vote. Oops. <laughs> and that's carried. Okay. Uh, now I will. Now support. I will take the chair back. All right, now we'll go to Councillor Reyes. Uh, just one quick question to administration. Uh, for the bike alley uh, upgrade, uh, due to the uh, bike access to underground uh, parking, 
uh, so this back early updates and who will be responsible for the cost? Uh, that will be the developer. So these all the developers. Correct. Uh, for the upgrade and for the back alley. Yes. Okay. So that's clarification. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So that concludes the questions to administration. At this time, I will ask if council members have any questions to administration, to the members of public and opposition, and to the proponent. Uh, out of the previous discussion, uh, any new information arising out of the previous discussion? There are? Okay, so please sign up. Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to turn to Mr. Murphy yeah. uh, to uh, provide his thoughts on the, the matter we were discussing in terms of the, the weight of the draft plan. If he was willing to speak to that. Absolutely, Councillor, and through you, uh, Your Worship. Uh, there is, first of all, uh, no SCONA district plan. Uh, there is a plan in progress and it's in its infancy and as you heard from administration, early drafts of it were submitted to the community and distributed uh, with the hope that the community could watch it grow, have input into it and so on, uh, but it can't be taken literally as a, anything more than a first draft. Uh, the cases uh, that my most excellent friend, Mr. Shores, uh, presented to council, say exactly what they do say. Uh, unfortunately, not what Mr. Shores hopes they would say. What those cases say, and there are two of them, is that uh, it is not a mistake for a municipal council to look at a draft plan. But it is the job of the municipal council to determine how much weight that draft should bear in the discussion on a particular uh, application such as the one today. Uh, in the cases that uh, uh, Mr. Shores addressed, both of those cases were dealing with very high level plans, general municipal plans, municipal development plans uh, that were very close to being finished. In fact, uh, in the case of the general municipal plan, uh, all that was waiting was for the minister to approve it, the provincial minister. So those, uh, those particular instances, uh, the courts held that it was not a mistake for the municipal council to take a look at them. And it's not a mistake for this council to take a look at the draft Skona district plan. But the issue is how much weight should you give it? And in the case of this particular plan, uh, in terms of relevance, you have to look at that draft plan in terms of knowing that an approval today necessarily informs the ongoing development of that plan, and you will have to know that what you do today will be reflected in that plan, because what you do today is something very specific, and the plan will have to adapt as it moves along to absorb what we're trying to do today. Uh, it's also undisputed law that an applicant, an applicant has the right to have his or her case decided on the basis of the law that is in place on the day the decision is made. And so that would be the law today. It doesn't prevent you from looking at the draft plan, but the applicant's entitlement is to have you apply the law as it exists today. Great, thank you so much. Uh, no further questions, Mr. Baer. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor So uh, I, I don't have any further yeah, questions. You can step Mr. back. Yes. Uh, so can, you're good from my end. I yeah. actually have some We'll questions. call you back if we, uh, if we need Alrighty. to ask more questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my, my first set of questions would probably be from the, some, someone from the team on Green Space Alliance or, or to Mr. Lamb directly. Um, you, you've now heard a lot of the conversation um, I've heard some suggestions, particularly from the last group of speakers from the Community League, about are there options to have a, you know, instead of a six story, you know, instead of 20 meters, you go to 17 and a half meters for five stories, uh, something like that. You know, I wanted to, I guess, give you a moment to to get your take on that and as to why, why maybe you didn't go down that path. Not sure much. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Lamp. Thank you. 
Hello, can you guys hear me? Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, initially, when we planned this project, there was three lots uh, butting up to the Windsor Terrace. And as we all know, Windsor is expensive, over a million dollars per one lot. And so initially, it was, in my mind, a high-rise site that we were going to scale down from Windsor Terrace in. Um, after digging through this and talking to planning, it was almost a no-go. Um, we've done concrete high-rises in the past. Uh, it is a affluent neighborhood, so we know we have to do something high-end. Uh, as we start digging more and more to it, uh, and the reason why we, there was only three lots is because there were two skinnies um, on one lot, so they were about $2 million for that lot. And in order to make uh, the missing middle, which is what I know the, the city plan calls for, the city of Edmonton is missing, uh, could you know? Could you do townhomes? Could you do du duplexes? Uh, we haven't figured a way to do that. Uh, just to put into perspective, if we were to build in the suburbs and we have um, use Keswick Windermere, went for about a million to 1.2 million an acre. The land price in Windsor, that's that we've paid for, is close to 10 million dollars an acre. And if you break it down to land price, you can build in Keswick Windermere, another affluent area. Ten to fifteen thousand dollars per door, uh, or go to Windsor, uh, and it's seventy thousand dollars per door. And so we've made a decision where we like to build an infill. We know it's harder. Uh, you have to go through the zoning process. It does take two or three years to go through this. Um, we've worked and had multiple meetings with the community. Um, they've been, you know, we've had conversations. Marcelo and my team. Uh, we felt they've gone well. We felt that we've compromised. Uh, did we give everything? Not at all, but the initial plans was from a high rise all the way down to a six story with, where it would be a straight rectangular building. That's the most cost effective, most efficient. Um, then we heard comments that we have to break up the building and it's the first time that we've done it where we've actually taken um, because they wanted to cut cascading effect from the Windsor Terrace of a high rise all the way down to six story. And then we cascaded down to a four story uh, on the. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, we've cascaded down to um, four on the north side. Uh, and that's where we were able to also break up the massing by adding a courtyard on that. And so when we do that, our FAR initially plan of 220 units, uh, 220 units for FAR, that was in my original design. We brought it down to close to three FAR with 170 and absolutely. Can you cut an extra floor off? Can you cut two floors off? Once you do that, my per door goes from 70, 80 grand a door to a hundred thousand a door to 130,000 a door. And we're almost talking about uh, West Coast, like, like Kelowna and Vancouver prices on that. And so it, I, I get, I get the, the residents. I think for sure, when you take a look at it, you know, property value that was 1.5, now it's 1.3 because you have a massive build. I get all the reasons. I have a friend. I have a friend that lives in there. His child goes to the Windsor School, and he's like, "Come on, Richie, come, like, why are you putting this building in here?" Like, I, I get all that, right? But at the same time, like, we are not asking for the city for any tax breaks, like we are, like they're doing in downtown. We're saying, we know we want infill development. We know it's good for the economy. We want affordable housing. Uh, and this whole project would be rental. If we did do a five, the, the building code, if you're going to do four story, a lot of developers you see out, all over the city from stadium lands, it's all six story wood frame. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to go higher and we do want to shrink the floor plate um, and not be as a wide building, we can do that, but at least let us go higher on it. And so that's it. Just, so to answer the question, uh, uh, Councillor Nack, it, it's an economic, it's just not feasible. It's impossible Dang. to do. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I'm answering the question. No, no. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you, Councillor. Councillor, right. Hi, thank you, Mr. Lamb. Do you want to continue on that sentence? It's not feasible. It's it's not feasible uh, to to put in townhomes and duplexes, um, and the five story. It's just it's getting risky. It's getting dangerous for us to like, to do this project. We'd almost. I'm sorry, we lost you, um, connection. Uh, yeah. Right. No, Go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry. What I was saying is we'd almost have to, if we've gone back and forth probably for about two years, and we did hear, can you be as high as the Bentley, the four-story Bentley, 
they have higher ceilings. Uh, and so we are close to that. But since then, the building code has changed and it has allowed developers to build instead of four story to six story. I think if the Bentley was to come on today, I think they would be asking for the RAA zoning. I know there's even talks from city, I believe the city of Edmonton, maybe Alberta, that any RA7 is might be moved to RA8 with a 3.3, with a 3 FSR uh, all the way to 3.3 if you got the bonus. And so I think, uh, I think we've done a really good job in mimicking that. Um, we were able to take a look at all the consultants from the traffic impact assessment, uh, make adjustments to our building. Uh, and if you were to ask, did you compromise? Absolutely we did. And I think Marcelo would be, uh, could definitely add to it because he was more uh, working with uh, city administration and planning and the community. Uh, but definitely he would come back up to me and go, can we do this, Richie? Can we do this? And as it started from 220 units, so otherwise we should have just went with the, the three lots um, and go for maybe a, an eight to 10 story concrete, right? So it's kind of confusing because like, we want missing middle, but in order to be missing middle, it's, it's six story. I think you're gonna see any future development come onto the table at city council, especially infill will most likely be, uh, especially if they're paying 10 million, that's the number, 10 million an acre, probably the highest land value um, to be bought. If, if not, it'd be pretty close if you don't count the downtown area. Okay, and going that six story would be what it would take to make it financially feasible for you. Is that right? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. We've, we, we've already, and it's not, okay. it's six story and we've trimmed it down. That should be, we've trimmed it down and we've also shrunk the north side so there's actually green space and courtyard. And I know the, on the flip side, you could say, Richie, big deal, who cares? Well, no, that's, <laughs> that's part of the $10 million an acre. We have to shut down and put it, it's nice. I liked it because it's a nice park area where kids can play. Yeah. Uh, but that's not, it's not fully six story. All our other buildings we've built in infill, it's from Garneau to the university side, they're all straight six stories. This one is six and then it drops to four story. Okay, thank you, yeah, and I do appreciate that little park space in there. Um, but you've touched on something else, and I don't know if, if it would be yourself or, Mar or Mar Marcelo to answer, um, in regards to the, the traffic um, in that laneway. Um, you know, looking at some of the photos that um, um, the coalition has provided, is there really sufficient space to get past those power poles or, or in the, in the wintertime with the snow buildup? That's probably Not something that. for Marcelo or the traffic, uh, yeah, the traffic through you, engineer. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor and, and Councillor Wright, uh, thank you for your question. I think this is more a uh, question to uh, our colleague, uh, Mike Wiedemann. He's the transportation engineer on this project. So, uh, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Marcelo, and thank you, Richie. Happy to, to try to jump in and help respond. Um, we've been... We acknowledge the, the community's concerns about the width of the alley and the you know incremental increase in, in traffic activity. As we've heard, the uh, right of way for the alley is six meters wide as part of this particular development. It will be uh, paved to a commercial alley standard based upon our discussions with uh, the transportation department. The power poles are, are in fact in the city's right of way. And um, and so uh, it, it's not it, it's not as if uh, they are located outside City Road right away. And we do believe that there will continue to be opportunities for two vehicles within the six meter uh, right of way to be able to pass. Uh, we also heard earlier about pedestrian accommodation within the alley. And in response to that concern, in response to the concern about the increased traffic activity in the alley, Westridge is actually providing a sidewalk facility immediately adjacent to the north-south alley to separate pedestrian movements from vehicular movements in the north-south alley, as well as providing a sidewalk over and above the six meter right of way along the south side of the building as well to enhance pedestrian accommodation and pedestrian safety. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Huberman, my time Thank is up. Thank you, Councillor Wright, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, Mr. Murphy, if you could come back, please. <laughs> yes, ma'am. 
Um, yeah, no, I just, um, I found the, you know, all of the community members that came and spoke today were very compelling, you know, around some things around, um, you know, feelings of cherry picking the city plan, those kind of things. And I saw you were taking some notes through those speaking. And so I was very compelled by their arguments, but I also wanted to give you the opportunity to hear some of your thoughts on what you heard from the, the panels. Well, uh, uh, through you, Your Worship, and uh, uh, thank you, Councillor, for that question. Uh, city plan is a very broad document. You know, people say you're painting with a broad brush. Uh, with city plan, you're painting with a spray gun. And so its provisions, in addition to being broad, are generally aspirational. It's where we want to go. And they are not prescriptive. You can't read city plan to say, aha, this section means you must do this or you must not do that. It's very aspirational. And so what folks will tend to do uh, on both sides of an issue will say, oh, here's a part I like in city plan and we're right there and uh, here's a part I like in city plan, we must be over here. The real test, in my respectful opinion, is is there anything in city plan that prohibits this development? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. Uh, you've heard from administration uh, that there are a lot of the goals of city plan, the aspirational goals, that are met by a project like this, but there is nothing in city plan, and I say this with great respect to the neighbors, there's nothing in city plan that prohibits this development, and indeed there's a lot in the plan that suggests it ought to go forward. That it ought to go forward. It ought to go forward in accordance with the aspirations of city plan. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. That was all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, James? Just stay there for I have Mr. The Murphy. I just want to follow up on that. Yes, sir. Uh, the, yes, city plan is aspirational, but city pl plan also talks about nodes and corridors, right? Uh, and this project is not within that. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. No, I, and Fair question, but this is exactly what I meant when I say city plan is broad brush planning. And I went further and said it's spray gun planning. Uh, but the idea is that you will find nodes and you will find areas that are influenced by nodes that you should be on the lookout for. So how does this, this, this is what, this, how, how is this site influenced by those nodes and corridors is because of close proximity, like what is? Well, because of, of the notion of what these nodes and corridors are all about. Uh, if you have a center of a community uh, that's widely influenced by the existence of a public service facility, say for example a school, sometimes it's LRT, sometimes it's various other things. In this case it just happens to be a school and play yard. That tells you you should be on the lookout for something more in line with a project like this, then you should be safe, for example, for single family housing. And so mm -hmm. even though, even though, as an aspiration, city plan says, we're gonna be looking for nodes, they aren't saying what the specific nodes are, they can't. Mm -hmm. Because that actually happens in the further down level planning of ASPs, ARPs, uh, and uh, neighborhood area structure plans, in addition to site specific zoning. Okay. So when, when we come down today to deal with the DC2, we're saying to you, take a look at this. Does this feel nodish? Okay. I can use such a terrible mm. word. But does this feel like a spot that fits within that concept of city plan, of mm. building around uh, something impactful like a school and playground and so oh. on? Does proximity to university factors into that or proximity to a neighborhood that is very high density such as Garno? Well, that's, uh, that's a very interesting question because on the one hand, uh, we on the city side have no jurisdiction at all over the university. Hmm. We can't tell the university what they can do and they can't do. Uh, so it's difficult in planning off of the university to do so with any rigidness and specificity because tomorrow the university might change their mind on what they're doing. Hmm. But in terms of in terms of the fact that the university is there, that would suggest to you that there's a feature that's driving the need hmm. for some higher density housing like okay. that. 
but it's, it, it, we can't, as I say, legally take it into account because we have no control over it. But darn it all, we know it's there. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and I will take the chair back. And I will go to Councillor Rice for questions. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So from my colleagues' questions, I heard the answer why you cannot build the full story. Uh, there are some like uh, compromises as well. So my question is about, uh, we talk about the city plan, but I want to go back to the residential infill guidance. Uh, what we heard from speaker today and talk about uh, the lack of compli compliance uh, of the proposal with the residential infill uh, in file guidance. Can you comment on that a little bit more? And then give that, what's that's, your thoughts? That is yeah. Mr. Murphy? Yeah, okay. or Ms. Murphy or anybody in the team. So uh, this yeah. is a question to the proponent. So yes. anybody yeah. who wants to answer this question? Um, to you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for the question, Councilor Rice. Uh, I think uh, from the beginning, um, we look into this uh, site uh, to uh, try to follow as much as we can closely all the policy framework that is in place in the draft. Uh, we never uh, try to uh, state that no, this is this is an old and this, that therefore it should be. But uh, as as much as I uh, I was listening to um, uh, Mr. Murphy and the other presenters, I don't think we we want to put forward a plan that says. Uh, only four stories and six story buildings within those and corridors and outside. If you're not in, you're out, and uh, therefore uh, this should be just low density. I think the, the city plan is aspirational and visionary and is written into a very positive way, uh, looking for opportunities to where things can be supported, but also to other opportunities where council and the community will bring forward but have not been identified. That's why it's a long-term plan. So, so thank you, thank you for the answer. Um, specifically, I'm a little bit struggling about understanding and how we keep that balance between the city development and also from the community perspective, that public trust. Because what I heard, they're talking about the present. President, we don't want to set up a president. So, is there any compromises, and from your end, to respond to that public trust in terms because any policy and for a city to put in implement, we really consider about what is a public trust, what is how we implement, and to take that balance. So, can you provide a little bit of comments on that as well? If uh, I might take that uh, yeah. yes. question, Your Worship, uh, to you, Councillor Rice. Uh, a couple of things uh, that you can take back uh, from Mr. Lamb's comments. And that are, those comments are, number one, uh, doing a project in this neighborhood is crazy expensive. Because the price of the land's high. Number two, in approaching a project like this, the developer does not walk in and simply say, I'm going to build this, and if you don't like it, too bad. There is back and forth that happens. But no developer can let a committee of neighboring citizens design the development. There is too much, quite frankly, at stake in the developer proceeding. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, here, uh, we have several hundred thousand dollars of neighborhood improvements over and above what's otherwise required being contributed by the developer. Where's that come from? You know, and if you, if you turn it over to the, uh, the committee of neighbors and say, folks, you design this, they don't take into account, and neither should they, they're not professional developers, the cost of providing those additional amenities. They don't take into account the cost of providing that great open space in this particular development to achieve the compromise of breaking up the massing. And so at the end of the day, the folks who are writing the check can only go so far. And if council agrees, as I think they should in this case, that they have done a yeoman's service and they are following the aspirations of city plan, 
then you ought to prove it. So I do have a follow-up question. I yeah. don't think I have enough time. I no worries. Can you Thank move you. the... Uh, I can move second round. Yeah, yes. Please. Okay. Second. Okay, please vote. Just waiting on one vote. I'm in favor. Thank you, Councillor Jans. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Dack. Actually, if Councillor Rice has a second round, maybe she can go first so Mr. Murphy doesn't have to walk up and down. I Never know. You know. Others may have questions to him. No, I no. only have questions for Ms. Solez. So we don't know. Ms. Like, uh, Councillor Rice, Councilor Rice yeah. go ahead. I need the exercise. You know. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for your answers and then two points, a few, a few key points here, also some contribution and some challenge or some compromises there. But my follow-up question, yes, I do say the, um, this contribution and for the community amenities sponsor and for this three like transportation infrastructure enhancement and also offside public um, amenity as well, like parks, gardens, open spaces. So my question is, and during the um, later stage, and in, in for this past, let me say this way, during later stage, and then right now, and in the bylaw, the proposal uh, sponsor cast for all this e infrastructure enhancement is 375,000. So if they need more to uh, accommodate the community needs and address the community concerns. Is the developer willing to put more money? And because right now I asked the question earlier to administration, how this number get it? And is there more number, is a bigger number, could be. And is that willing? And then for me to ask this question, I really want to reflect uh, some comments I received from the community. So, at the beginning, we have this contribution, but later on, the five years later, six years later, and the community comp, like amenities and it's still not built. So I just want that to be um, answered very clearly. Okay, well, uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, first of all, I, I'll defer to Mr. Lamb ultimately on whether or not he's hit his final position. Uh, I can tell you from working with these folks for a long time, that uh, they like to build things, and they actually do build a lot of projects here in the city. So it would be my uh, thinking that they have gone to about where they want to go, where they're willing to go. And so what you have before you uh, is not an opportunity, and I say this with great respect, to sit down and see who's bravest and have a, uh, an on-the-fly negotiation, which we're not going to participate in. We have instead a proposal that we think, and we respectfully submit, meets the requirements of city plan, meets the requirements of the neighborhood to the extent we can, and meets the goal of the city in terms of densification, growth, and the turnover of existing neighborhoods. That's all I can say. I don't know, Richie, if you're still on the line, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, uh, thank you for that, uh, Jim. Th that, is, that is correct. Like all of the negotiation, um, and it was like I said, years of back and forth, the community contribution was just one part of it. Um, and that's what has to be done uh, on it. So that's, uh, that's where it stands right now. Thank you. Okay, that, that's my question. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Nack. Uh, thanks, Mayor. So uh, I'm good with you. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Solez, I, I do have a, another question towards you as you're coming down. Um, Mr. Johnson will regularly tell us, as you know, that you know the financials uh, aren't relevant to our consideration right. today. Um, and, and yet, I'm still going to ask slightly about that. So. Um, because uh, you did raise it in your presentation, and Mr. Collier, you also touched on this about there is this challenge that exists in your community where land values are quite high. Um, it's just the nature is where the you know, location, 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 you, you've got high land values. And so trying to uh, build something that will produce 
more affordable units, or I think we can say in this community, relatively affordable units is probably a more fair descriptor, does require some type of working through. And so I guess I want to pose to you, you've suggested a compromise um, of five and three, and, and I wanted to ask you, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm hearing mixed views, and this is close, and so I'm trying to figure out what's the right way forward. Um, you know, there's four stories on the one side, but it also has a much larger setback than what we would normally expect under the RA7 zone. So I wonder, even in, in your original compromises, I think about the four-story areas is maybe less of a concern to me because you've got a six-meter separation distance versus a standard of three. But is there, so is that something you think you'd be willing to talk about with the applicant if you had that conversation about, you know, maybe just looking at the six versus five story, but leaving the four instead of the three? What are your thoughts, just as somebody that's been doing planning and setbacks and all that for years? Well, this is a, a you know, coming at me, I, this is the know, first time yeah, I've heard this. Exactly. Uh, just, I mean, I'm certainly we would, would consider it, and but what we would really like this um, applicant to do is to purchase another set of houses mm. for this project in the locations we've shown you some pictures yeah. that show all the all, all the places where no new houses would be demolished or have to be moved to accommodate a project like this where it wouldn't impact the same neighbors there are as mr collier said so m you know many kilometers of of um, roadways uh, in the neighborhood where this could be accommodated that wouldn't impact the school, wouldn't impact these same neighbors. And we know this um, uh, this developer because we have seen this happen. He started with three properties. He then went shopping for more when he realized he couldn't do quite what he wanted with the three. He's able to buy other, he could sell these and buy uh, other properties in the neighborhood and that would not have this resistance to a six-story proposal. Sure. The other question I want to ask, and again, appreciate that I'm sort of throwing these all on the fly, and because I'm I'm hearing everything, I'm trying to process as well and think through what what the right solution is here. Um, you know, if you went shorter than your six stories, that probably eliminates the ability to have the S style building that you have because again back to that idea of unit count if we're trying to build as, as affordable as humanly possible in an area that might not generally be affordable the most um, that costs more to do that than it would be a, lo a long rectangular building and is that you know so if you have a smaller building but it's a larger you know it's it's a solid rectangle versus an S shape what are your thoughts again appreciating it's a bit on the fly I'm just I wanted to get your senses I'm sure you've thought through all these options and considered this to a some a little bit of a degree. Well, so. this really hadn't uh, come up um, a lot in uh, in previous discussions, but we don't view that courtyard as particularly um, community friendly. Oh, okay. uh, this, the building still reads as a very long, a massive building. So if it came, if it didn't have that courtyard, yeah. It wouldn't be the end of the world. There is a playground right across the street. Uh, the other thing about that courtyard is that it too is going to be in the shade. The six-story part of it mm -hmm. is on the south. That's where all the all the light comes in. That and the west, and it isn't very open on the west. It doesn't get that much light from the west because of the of the the S shape, so that was more that we saw more as a an amenity for the residents, um, which you know there are going to be a lot of residents in there, and you know it's nice not to have to cross the street and, and have a have a, an, an outdoor amenity, uh, but there are also rooftop amenities in, in the building as well. So the, that um, that S shape isn't a big deal for us in the front. It's helpful in the back, um, where the S, the part, the S in the back is a little bit smaller. The the indentation is a little bit smaller for the parkade, but it is. But because it is a parkade, perhaps that, that S part could be retained. I'm out of time, but thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Prince Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. S or Ms. Salas, I'll um, ask you a question first. Uh, and I know I've heard 
uh, the community members today and yourself say that you are um, not opposed to densification, just maybe this isn't the right area or the right uh, appropriate building in this area. Now, because the area, the neighborhood itself, really could use a lot more densification considering the numbers, do you think that realistically with the cost of land that the densification can still get up to you know the city standard if this proposal isn't approved? Um, I think it can, and the reason I say that is that if you buy a piece of property in the neighborhood, which you know several people have talked about how you know the price of it, and just use it to build a single family house or to subdivide it for two, that isn't you know, that isn't very cost effective from a cost investment perspective. So I think that it's still possible. It's desirable area to live in as you know, and it's and the land value reflects the desirability. Uh, so I don't think it it's going to be particularly difficult. It's it's going to take longer in our neighborhood than than neighborhoods than other neighborhoods, but it's it's possible. And something's going to happen with the, the houses, you know, the the older housing stock, eventually, and we expect to see. You know, and we'd rather see some three-story, walk-up style um, apartments within uh, within the neighborhood. These are very large lots as well, not only expensive lots but large lots. Um, we we ex would expect to see that, given the the size of the lots, the location, the the investment um, uh, opportunities there. We would expect to see that instead of only sing single family houses in the interior of the neighborhood. We, you know, we, we would expect to see that going forward. There was a 75 foot lot up for, uh, that uh, people wanted to rezone to RF2 so they could subdivide it twice instead of once, which you can do in RF1. And neighbors said, we'd rather see a small apartment building on that lot. So, I mean, it's not like there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of resistance going forward. Okay, yeah, Mr. Collier, I was going to ask you, or Collier, Collier, I was going to ask you that question as well because you had mentioned that you would like to see the densification spread throughout the neighborhood as opposed to just in the area, is that correct? Yes, I was recently in Toronto and they have communities that are surrounded by busy streets and on the busy streets, it's all built up, 10 stories, five stories, all sorts of stuff, old new developments. And in the side of the community, there's walk-ups and everything. And it's a great symbiotic relationship because you get the density from the edges and the collectors and the arterials, and they act like sound buffers. And so the communities are very quiet. Um, Mr. Lamb's, let's say it was $10 million that he spent, he could get more if he buys on an arterial or an ar arterial or collector and be able to build a project that he wouldn't have to step down on one side. He could have it six stories all the way or a group of six story buildings or, you know, all depending on the site and stuff like that. So it is possible, higher density on these collector and arterials and then the planned low density zone for the interior with probably some exceptions as we all know come down the line. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. That's thank it you. for me, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Uh, I have a question to legal smirk. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair? So, Ms. Johnson, is affordability a consideration for council when we make a decision on somebody's ability to build? Financially, that's fine, right? Uh, we don't consider that, but housing affordability in the city, is that a consideration? Absolutely. Uh, so we don't consider profit margins or how much money in a developer yeah. make, anything yeah. of that sort, business case-wise. Yeah. There's a few things to keep in mind. Uh, the MGA, um, under the planning sections, talks about one of the considerations is economical development of land. So that's before you. Affordability, affordability for sure is, as far okay. as the community and what you see as trends going um, for better or for worse, as well as the notion of the viability of a development. Okay. If you believe you've heard evidence that this land just won't develop below a certain standard, then that is before you. 
Oh, I see. Does that make sense? It. Yeah, got it. Another question I have is coming out of uh, Mr. Murphy's question around if we were to consider uh, guidelines that will come in the future sometime, right? And we make our decision today based on those future guidelines, how would that, uh, that does that set a precedent to, uh, to influence the outcome of those future guidelines? It, it, it doesn't set a precedent, but yeah. I do think that uh, the drafters of those future documents would be very wise to be watching what council is doing okay. and taking guidance from, from the decisions you make. If you're seeing areas that should be more built up, they, when they come to me asking about drafting, I'll say, we should be looking at that. In, in what you're doing in drafting. Keep in mind that this level of that drafting is administrative. There has been no um, vetting or endorsement by council. Right. So even after that, it could still come back to you and you could still say you went too far. So that, that still comes to council. You are yeah. still the decision maker on those plans. But there's, there's, there's They'll an, look at it for guidance. This, so there's an speaking. influence of that. Right? Not a precedent, but an no, influence. No, there's an yes. influence of that, right. And then uh, uh, if, if future guidelines do come and they are uh, beyond what, say for example, if we were to make a decision, say we're not going to approve this based on whatever their future early draft guidelines were, but in the future guideline, different guidelines approved with higher density, right? Can the proponent come back and not come back and is there legal risk for us that? There's not legal risk. Okay. The proponent uh, or the owner of the land at any point could look at a reevaluation of what they could do with this land if it isn't approved today. Um, after the waiting period that's required, of course, they, uh, they could bring the same proposal. If they then have different statutory plans that provide more um, leverage to, to put forth their case, um, they could do it even without that leverage, frankly. Okay. They, they have lots of recourse in that regard. There's no legal liability here. Council's making a a decision on a direct control zoning and there's no inherent right to rezoning. Got it. Okay. Good. All right. So those are the questions I had. I'll take the chair back, Councillor Stevenson. Okay. So that concludes the questions on uh, uh, new information. At this time, uh, we are ready to close the public hearing on this bylaw. Mr. Mayor, would it be appropriate to, to make a motion to take the recess now instead of 3.30, just before we start? We are at 3.19, right? I'm just thinking, take it now before we start that process versus breaking partway? We, Second. We can, yeah, no, why not? We're very flexible. Yeah. We're here till 5 o'clock. Right, so, so, okay, well, we don't need to vote on it. We don't just, we take recess early, right? We can do that. Clerk? Yeah, I can, we'll take recess now at 3.20 and we'll be back at 3.35.
We're live from council chambers. All right, we're back. And uh, do a roll call of council members. Councilor Wright. Good afternoon. Councilor Knack. Good afternoon. Councilor Principe. Hello. Councilor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councilor Paquette. Councilor Paquette. Councilor Tang. Hello. Councilor Hamilton. Hello. Councilor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Councilor Salvador. Good afternoon. Councilor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councilor Rice. Here. Councilor Jens. Good afternoon. And I'll check if Councilor Paquette is here. Nope. Okay, we were. We concluded the questions on the new information. At this time, we are ready to move the closing of the public hearing on this bylaw. Okay. All right. Who would like to move the closing of the public hearing on this bylaw? I'll move closer. Um, okay. Public hearing. Councillor Salvador, I need a second. Second, second by Councillor Stang. Right. Uh, all right. So we have. The motion on the floor to close the public hearing. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Can someone move the first reading, please? Um, I'll move first reading of Charter Bylaw 20384. Okay, need a seconder. Second. Councillor Tang seconded that. We have the first reading on the bylaw on the floor. At this time, ask council members if they wish to speak. Councillor Knack. Thanks, Mayor Sophie. I might as well start us off because really I'm just going to talk through my thoughts like I do once in a while in public hearings. Um, because where I'm at right now, and this is, I feel like this is my, you know, I occasionally do this where I get to speak about something that probably based off my position will annoy everyone in the room. Um, because I'm leaning towards not supporting it. But for most of the reasons not raised by the community, I think there's, um, and that's why I'm going to annoy everyone in the room. Um, because I actually think this building, generally speaking, looks excellent. I think built form is good. I'm generally comfortable with its placement overall, um, based off how the city plan has been designed, how we are trying to do step downs. I'm not as worried about traffic concerns. We have, uh, there was a list by administration much earlier. I represent a number of communities that have plenty of apartment buildings around school sites uh, immediately across the street from schools. So I'm not worried about those reasons. I'm not worried about the back alley. Um, so I'm not worried about most of the reasons that have been shared except for one, and that is the piece tying in a little bit to that conversation around trust and the SCONA plan. And I appreciate the comments I've heard from a lot of folks today um, on administration that that should probably be a low or a, a very li limited weight. But I've been going to these public hearings for a long time, <laughs> as, as others have, and I don't think that's how the community views it. Right? They view it right now as, as the draft plan is quite clear in what it suggests. And th if this passes, and even if it didn't, frankly, the draft plan probably should be updated when it does come back to reflect a bit more of that reality. But that's not actually what's before us right now. And I think back to before the approval of the city plan, I was often the annoying lone voice who would vote against uh, row housing on a corner lot that wasn't across from a school or park site prior to the approval of the city plan because at the time, the residential infill guidelines were the primary guiding document we were using. And even though I think that overall, it makes more sense to build higher density, and in that case, it was just row housing on a corner lot, um, the overall guiding document didn't yet have it in. And so I'm put in a, I feel a little bit like I'm in a similar place right now in that I think by approving it now, there is that, that risk that we heard from some of our speakers around how that impacts their trust on the work that we're doing. Even though I think there's so much good in this application. <laughs> 
and that's why I'm struggling. I mean, I, I think height-wise, it's further away from the, the property than we would accept in an RA, or further away than we would require an RA7. The height is less than what you would approve in an RA8. Uh, the side of site that is a bit higher, so I actually think this is a great gradual transition. And so it's, it's very little to do with the actual building, and it's everything to do with just how we're trying to, to build that trust. So as I noted at the kickoff, this is me talking through my thoughts because I, I, I truly am struggling. I, I want to support this for all of the same reasons I've supported density like this across the city, including in the ward I represent, um, time and time and time again. But I also think we need to be very thoughtful when we're going against a plan, albeit a draft plan, and one that is likely going to be changed um, based off the reality that we face, but that's not, that new changed plan is not what's before us right now, and that's why I'm struggling. So, uh, so I don't think I have anything additional to add. I will listen intently to hear all of my colleagues because I, I, I think there's a lot of good, but I'm, I'm still hung up on that one point, and, and I think for the community's sake, I understand why they would, they would want us to be hung up on that point right now. So thank you, Mayor Sophie. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mayor Sophie. I really appreciated the conversation today and all the speakers uh, for, for being here. You know, I was excited to hear how much support there was from speakers in terms of the overall safe plan vision uh, and the recognition of the value that more compact, walkable, uh, and uh, mixed use communities with a range of housing options uh, provide. So for me, this proposed project does very much align with the spirit and intent of city plan. Uh, we want to see development in central areas of our city. I, I actually feel that the school, the community league and the park actually are, are a node in themselves. Um, not to mention again, the, the adjacent uh, university amenities, the access to LRT, um, so for all of those reasons, I really feel that this is an appropriate spot uh, for uh, an opportunity for more, more people to live in this, in this area. But I do, you know, really appreciate that many speakers express the disconnect that they see between city plan and, and how that's, um, you know, initially been, been translated down into our draft district plans. Uh, and I agree it's a significant issue. It's a significant trust building issue. Um, it's, it's something that we have, as council has raised, have raised um, and, and it's something that I'll be following up on very, very diligently as we move forward with the district plans. But the reason I feel comfortable moving forward with the rezoning now is that we're not making this decision in the absence of planning guidance policy. Uh, again, I think there is great clarity in, in city plan in terms of what the expectations are uh, for, for how we want our community to, to grow and change over time. Um, I think that, you know, we could find ourselves in a position where we, we can't approve any rezonings until district plans are complete. And I don't think that that allows for the orderly development of our community, um, or, you know, really, really works for anyone that creates even greater uncertainty. Uh, we, are, we are working with a vision that we have in front of us that was the result of um, thousands of Antonians' inputs, has been reviewed, refined, uh, and fully approved by council. Uh, so I think we can come back to that and move forward with confidence. So I look forward to supporting this uh, rezoning and uh, uh, encourage my colleagues to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Costa Stevenson. Costa Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think I, like a lot of my colleagues, are, are still working through this. Um, I, I think over the lunch hour, I was um, more inclined to, to, to vote against this. I, but I'm, I'm trying to look at how development is occurring across the city. Um, and I think maybe more specifically, um, in the, some of the newer areas um, that I represent in Ward Small Matapi, um, We've got an RA7 um, development next to a school, which is already on a, a lottery system. Um, and then more recently in the fall, um, we approved uh, an RA6 to an RA7 in the same area just down the street from the school. And I'm looking at those documents and that put us at a density of 45 units per hectare. Um, the one that's being requested here today is much less than that. 
Um, I think even if we do take into account um, the the units at, at uh, Lister Hall area. Um, I think I think infill is, is what we need. The infrastructure and amenities are in place. Um, or and any upgrades I think will be borne by the developer. Uh, and I'm also concerned that maybe development, development in this area might not occur by the developer if we were to refer back or, or to uh, vote against it. So I think, I think my vote will be uh, to vote in favor of this development. Um, and I, I, as Councillor Knack said, I think the, the form of the building um, does address you know, some of the concerns with the, the extra little community space or, or garden space in front. Um, as part of the part of the the S curve, um, and I and I I trust that the developer has also taken into account the safety issues with the the traffic in the laneway. Um, so for that reason, I or for those reasons, I I will be voting in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, I'm very struggling for this one and I feel like it's a very difficult decision for me. I do say uh, this proposal rezoning actually brought lots of benefits and it chooses a surrounding uh, area specifically for the university and then for the university future expectation and for our students and because it's a rental property and nearby and the university as well. And also the most important sense I saw from developer perspective, they did a lot of compromise and to address the concern and from the community and also and put the contribution and to improve and enhance the community amenities. So I, I do see lots of good sense for this uh, proposal recently. And specifically, the developer demonstrates that uh, social responsibilities and uh, that build the city at the same time to contribute to our community as well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I actually experienced as a really new councillor. I can tell you this story in my own words. Uh, as a new first term councillor, after I voted, and it, it happened in my ward, there are two rezoning past few years ago. And right now, it still negatively impact the ward residents. I'm, I, I'm, I'm constantly to hear uh, what uh, the community and neighbors, residents in that rezoning area or around the area and still come to me and to request the auditing process to address their concerns. And every time and when I visit neighborhoods and when they talk about those type of rezoning bylaw approved and you can feel their emotion. And then even five years right now, and then this, you still feel that. So that actually provides the points to me to think about. Yes, our community is a shared community, is everybody's community. And if it's everybody's community, and for the residents who actually live in the community, even if they feel they're not be heard by the local government. If they feel and then even their voice cannot be just justified, justified and in the process, uh, making process, in the decision making process. Uh, as a counselor, I think I have that responsibility to make sure the people's voice and to be heard. And then I said that uh, is not, I. I agree with the Councilor Nack. It's not about the reason I heard and from the community residents say this is a safety uh, school and all these type of concerns. And what I can say from the efforts developer put there to actually compromise them. So it's more about, yes, this community is for everyone. And how we, uh, the government, how we can ensure everyone be, feel like they're be heard. And then this public trust is so important. 
and for us. So that is why I feel that this decision is so difficult and, and a challenge and to make it. Um, I'm still, uh, yeah. And a another point I want to say, um, another point is about the, the residential infill guidance for that new draft. Uh, the question come to my mind is, if everything, everything and for the infill guidance is doing really well, why we need to make the change in the future and for the another type of updates for that residential infill guidance. So that is that reminder to say where we have something we need to consider right now and instead of in the future. So I think based on all these uh, reasons, I am willing to vote no and for this, but I'm, I'm willing uh, to hear my colleagues and what they speak about this. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, uh, I came into this with a, a fairly open mind because um, uh, I, you know, uh, and I think lots of members of council prior to the opening of the public hearing heard from from people on both sides of this. Um, uh, I um, want to say that maybe the most compelling thing I heard in terms of the scale and size of this development was about the sun shadow and how that will impact the ability to enjoy um, the, the properties of people who live adjacent to this site. Um, I, um, I think it was really helpful to hear from Mr. Ritchie, uh, or sorry, Mr. Lamb, Ritchie Lamb, uh, in terms of what the, the sort of financial considerations are, although I am not using that in um, my decision today, um, but I think it's a helpful window into understanding the evolution of a development and maybe why we get the build forms we get. Um, I, um, I also found it helpful that Mr. Murphy, uh, Mr. Murphy said, um, and I'm going to have to reflect on this some more, that the consideration of what, um, what should be built or, or how, how the plan should be considered isn't just what is in the plan, but also what is excluded or prohibited. What are the types of things we're not trying to get? And when I look at this development, I don't see that um, uh, sort of prohibited or restricted uh, in terms of what the vision for that rebuildable city is. In fact, I look, I hear what Councillor Wright is saying in most new um, developing neighborhoods, uh, medium residential is in fact, um, being put across from school sites um, and and being put at the entrances to, uh, or is the gateway to neighborhood with detached residences. And I think um, that's a built form that I think we're gonna see more of. Um, Councilor Stevenson brought up Holy Child School, which is surrounded by high density uh, uh, development, um, but has also seen a narrowing of streets um, to restrict, I'll say, the, the influx of, of parking and traffic is, traffic issues. Um, uh, I, I caution to the arguments that I heard as well. Um, there was a lot of appeals for family housing. And I'll remind people that families look a lot different across our city and restricting um, the notion of one type of housing to family oriented uh, is is restricting, I think, um, or overlaying what our expectations or our own biases about family makeup is. And while um, three bedrooms are certainly helpful in terms of uh, condo and apartment residences for um, larger households that may look uh, and feel a lot differently. So I really caution against that. Similarly, um, I, I heard that the, the consideration of the on-campus residential um, was not taken into account. And I would caution that student residences are limited in access. They're not available to the market. They're not available at market rates. And it's a very narrow view of who needs housing in this community um, in Windsor Park and beyond across the, the south side. So um, uh, those are 
are things that I would caution uh, in, in terms of how we um, consider this development. Uh, and I also want to address the issue I heard about trust building. Um, this this has been, I think, unfortunately, an issue um, for many years, even prior to my timeline council. But I don't know that it's specific to this application. Um, and I don't know if it would be fair to hold this application accountable for the um, larger, uh, I would say, issues with understanding of the land use process within um, within the city. I uh, agree that is something we need to work on as the zoning bylaw renewal and the draft district plans proceed. Um, but I don't know that it's on this particular development to, to be accountable for. And um, last, I think if uh, we were to refuse this today, then I would expect that in a number of years, we would see, and, and a short number of years, I'll say, uh, we would see a much higher, uh, much more dense development proceed. And um, I also don't think that would be an appropriate fit for the community. So with that, I think uh, I'm inclined to support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Uh, these are really difficult choices. I, uh, I always struggle with these mightily. And uh, not so much from sort of a, an overall neighborhood perspective. Uh, in this particular instance, we're really just steps off of 87th Avenue and adjacent to a, a pretty large green space in a school. So there's some value in that, but what really uh, gives me pause is uh, hearing from those that are gonna be immediately adjacent to the building. You know, those that are gonna use sunlight or that they're gonna lose their garden or they're gonna lose their sight lines. That always uh, really sticks with me. I I'll, I will sit and I will think about how I would like it if, you know, a six-story building or an eight-story building or a 12-story building uh, was constructed more or less immediately out my back window. I'm not sure I'd be really excited about that. So I understand that and I get that and I feel that tension. But I, but I, I do think that there's a, a larger, greater good conversation here. And... Um, I think it's unfortunate that these things tend to be concentrated in, in those most mature communities in Edmonton. But the fact of the matter is that we do have a, you know, a very generalized goal of building up and not building as much out. And so I, you know, I think we're in transition in a couple of ways. One of those is that these neighborhoods that are our oldest and do have the, the oldest housing stock that is gonna get renewed are likely to be the first uh, to turn over. And, and you know, we, we have to consider that, that our city is reaching that age where the original city is being replaced by the next generation of the city in terms of built stock. I think the other transition though that we're contemplating here is, is and I think this does not necessarily get uh, the same consideration or, or the consideration that it should. And that's that for the longest time, the limit on a wood frame structure was four stories. And that was a code-driven limitation. And it became effectively our arbitrary de facto limit on the height of a multi-unit residential building. Uh, it was a code-driven uh, uh, prescriptive uh, rule that you couldn't go higher than that. So to build a five or six or seven story building became very cost prohibitive. You were forced to use different materials and those were not economical until you got to the eight, nine, 10 story building. We had this gap between four stories and eight stories, I would say, where economic buildings were not available. And I think if they were, going back many years, even decades, we would have seen a lot more five and six story buildings uh, and they would have become commonplace and we would have gone through this, this, this transition that uh, larger, taller buildings are gonna be taking their place in uh, particularly in our core neighborhoods. So I think that this transition is is overlapping with our uh, with the renewal of our built stock and our built form, and uh, I can understand how that is really distressing uh, to those that have to live right next to it. I, the other thought that's been uh, coming to mind today is that the University of Alberta is often described as a commuter university. Uh, still today, the vast number of uh, vast majority of students and people that work in, in that small city are coming to it every day by some other means. They don't necessarily live close. That doesn't mean that there's not some that live close, but uh, this is a campus that is surrounded by, you know, 
pretty low density residential neighborhoods. And I think there's going to be continuing tension and transition of those neighborhoods from that perspective, that this is a uh, university is a big place and there's a need to accommodate uh, more people closer to it. I know that these are not popular decisions, uh, but that is the choices that, uh, or the choice that we are forced to contemplate. Uh, and again, what is, what is the next best step for our city? Uh, what is the next best step in the evolution of our city? And uh, while it's not great for everybody, I think that this is something that uh, we should support and is a reasonable development uh, at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartemel. Councillor Jans. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for this. Uh, first of all, may I ask legal, uh, because I, in fairness, missed a good chunk of the, the hearing since 1.30, am I still eligible to participate here? Councillor, you are. The law requires you be here for a portion of the public hearing, so you've met that requirement. Okay, so I, I did I did receive written submissions. I read all yep. of them. I did have an opportunity to, to hear hear some of it. So I just it's completely um, appropriate that you continue on. And uh, uh, I just don't want my vote to be challenged or ineligible or anything. No, this is pretty uh, clear case law on this. Okay, hearing no objection. Then yeah, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, so. It's funny, actually, I, I, I moved into Lin Windsor Park in South Windsor Park in uh, the small town of Lister Hall in 2003, 20 years ago. Uh, and, you know, I've got many positive uh, memories of living in the neighborhood and uh, being on, on that side of campus. And, and I think for uh, from meeting with a lot of folks um, and maybe for, for other parts of my ward, it's, it's a little different or for, for your wards, it's different. Like Windsor Park for a good solid uh, 50 years when Lister Hall was the tallest feature on on that on that side and and only recently in the last couple of years have have both the Bentley and the, and the other build gone up and the new one isn't even occupied yet so it, it's such like when when the neighborhood's talking about the the the, the shock and the, the fitting the context of the community and the massing and the concerns there it is a very dramatic change for this community for all of these residents it's it's uh you're going to be able to look across to west edmonton mall from the roof of of this project if it if it was built like this is a a big change for a lot of folks and uh and uh i i think that i keep coming back to that what is the context of the community here and um i think hearing from a number of folks about looking for urban character row housing looking for town housing looking for um dense and and twilliger town type dense um opportunities here would be much, much more suitable. I, I think the fear about um, just the massing that this, this is the first essential incursion in, into the, into the, the interior of the neighborhood, either the north or the south, but could effectively now open the door to 116th Street, 117th Street, 118th Street, South Windsor Park as well, all now kind of being op open up for similar development if, if there's not, um, sort of a sense of predictability and fair, fairness to the to the neighbors of what of what to expect so i think that that um that point has really really resonated with me in the correspondence um i still i still have some major concerns about the the traffic management plan 87th is a nightmare in the morning i avoid it a ton of folks um come from st albert yes we should build them the the lrt yes council Rutherford, i hear you uh but like they come down groat road and and you see from from the uh you know the Mayfair up up the bank, the Mayfair up Groat. Like there's there's a ton of traffic, and the the idea that I would be you know getting out of bed in the morning and then getting getting down to to my car and then getting to work, um, trying to just sitting there in the alley trying to get out of that alley and then sitting trying to get left on 87th or or right, and you know it's it, um, this is this is a a an, an intensity that I think is is really, um, is very significant. It should not be understated there too, um. Going forward as well, I note that the developer is providing six three-bedroom condos, and um, I'm aware on rent faster. Or sorry, on uh, I just did a search on MLS. There is one three-bedroom condo available for per, uh, for purchase under two million dollars in Garneau. Uh There's none in Windsor Park. There's none in others. Right? Like this is a like the the three-bedroom condo, which for many folks at the university are professors, are are grad students, or PhDs, or postdocs, are they have a little one, they're they're here for a little while. Like having three bedroom condos is is I I think something that we really need to be emphasizing, especially if we want to see a built form that's shifting here. And to see this only has six uh, is concerning for me. So um, even even as it stands, yes, we I, I take I, I know there's not to dox my colleagues. I know there's an, 
at least one of us who has a kid in a condo and and it's uh it's it's challenge it's it you know it comes with its own challenges and opportunities but but the the shortage of three bedrooms is also something that i think had we had we better way to regulate that in i think we would have seen a better um mix and response from the community but at the end of the day when when you have a mass that's so large and imposing and such a big change it's such a big shock and bringing with it all those extra traffic concerns and bringing with it the um all of that i i i think that's a a, a big challenge and, and finally like I, I am aware the students union has a farmer's market sometimes i guess you can get a gallon of milk at the sev but like there's not really amenities here that that can be attractive that it's still i'm worried will like with safeway being two and a half kilometers away that it still kind of will lock in a bit of a an auto dependency so like this intensity without without some commercial in there too i, I really worry about so um yeah i um i i i think i've articulated my concerns and i'm out of i'm out of time thank you thank you Councillor chance Councillor rutherford Yes, thank you, and thank you to my colleagues uh, for for the great debate, and to the members of the public and, and the applicant for the time being here today and discussing this. Um, there, there's a lot to unpack, and I think you know one of the things that I think about as I've been listening to many of the the impassioned community members and my colleagues talking about, you know, this really is a true impact on community. This really is, and that's why public hearings have such a high high bar and threshold where we have to create that equal playing field for everybody to be heard. Absolutely. But one of the things that I keep coming back to is this idea of trust and what is trust? And for me, trust is consistency in actions. And so when I think about approval of other, when we've had other communities come and talk about similar impacts, we've still approved that. We've had other communities come, um, you know, just even recently, Councillor Wright talked about a few from her area, but I think about Garneau as well. Um, I think about how we have talked at lengths at this table about housing affordability. And not just, you know, affordable housing, but how do we create market-driven affordable housing and how do we make sure we're not we keep Edmonton as one of the most affordable cities in, Edmund, in, in the country. And as was stated today, there's no possible way that you're going to get lower density than this proposal in front of us today at a price that doesn't price people out in this area. That's just the fact. And so if I'm thinking about consistency, my actions have to match my words, and I've said how important housing affordability is. And so to be consistent, I have to support this. So between those two things of, of staying true to the city plan in other contexts and other communities, and with the context of housing affordability, I feel imperative that I, I, that I support this. Understanding it is impactful and understanding that uh, it, is, it is not easy for any community. And I know because my residents from the ward I represent were here earlier they didn't get their item too but I know that whatever the outcome of that decision was you know these are these are they're here because they care and because it's important um, you know it, and it's funny just to speak about the the three bedroom condos or not you know I don't live in a condo right now but I actually uh, <laughs> downsized from a house to a condo after having two kids and was living in Garneau and would bike over to this park with my kids in the little uh, a bike trailer often, or go to that safe way that you're referring to. And so I, I know this area intimately well uh, with my younger kids exploring this part of the city and being a part of the city, but we didn't live in a three bedroom condo. I had two kids, my husband and I, and we were not in a three bedroom condo. So I think that idea that that is what a family needs uh, to be a family oriented housing it is, is really, as Councillor Hamilton pointed out, really creating a very stereotypical of what a family unit is and what it looks like and how we live. I also lived in Japan where, you know, families were living in much smaller units than we would ever consider acceptable here in Edmonton, right? So uh, I think it's really important to consider 
consider all of those. Um, but it was, it's not an easy decision, absolutely. Um, but I'm gonna be uh, making my decision grounded, as I said, in that consistency and actions across uh, bigger policy uh, conversations. And I would ask my colleagues to consider that as well. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Stevenson, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. I just want to start by thanking uh, the members of the community for uh, uh, coming here today and sharing your thoughts and your concerns. Uh, like many of my colleagues, uh, uh, I, I share uh, those concerns. I understand the impact on you and whether it's sun shadowing, whether it's traffic or other concerns that you have identified. I also want to appreciate that you are embracing uh, the vision uh, of, uh, uh, of more infill, more uh, compact communities, uh, and, uh, and being part of uh, living the city plan. Appreciate, really, really appreciate, appreciate that. Uh, I know that uh, change is difficult. Uh, change uh, brings some uncertainty, brings some anxiety. Uh, you have seen that, you have embraced that in your community, and I hope that you will continue to embrace that, uh, that change, because that change is absolutely important for us to build a more sustainable community. Our goal is to be a community of 2 million people by 2065, and half of that future growth has to be accommodated within the existing neighborhoods. So if we are not consistent in the, implication, in the implementation of our city plan, then we probably would not be able to meet that ambition of accommodating half a million population in the existing neighborhoods. It is also a more, I would say, uh, physically and financially responsible approach to take. We have the existing infrastructure in uh, mature neighborhoods, including your neighborhood. Uh, we need to better utilize that infrastructure. LRT is 900 meters away. There's a good bus service on uh, on uh, on 87th Avenue. Uh, there's a you know we're investing in bike infrastructure in that uh, that neighborhood. So there are transportation choices. Uh, so we will got to better utilize that uh, that infrastructure. Another is affordability. You know we uh, uh, we need to create opportunities in every community for affordable housing. Yes, this project would not be as affordable, say in compared to Millwoods or uh, Castle Downs, but it will still be affordable compared to what uh, the single price, the single family homes are in that, uh, that neighborhood. So building those inclusive, welcoming, cohesive communities is absolutely part of, uh, of our, our ambitions of uh, building an Edmonton for all of us, where everyone is able to live in the community that they desire to do so. A lot of work to do on that, that end. It's also tied to economic growth. We need to make sure that we are supporting uh, development in the community there where you know, good projects can move forward and this is one of those, uh, those projects. I also wanna to touch on, uh, on, on trust issue. Um, if some of you feel uh, distrust in the process, I apologize for that. But I think the best way we can restore that trust is exactly what Councillor Rutherford was talking about being consistent in our approach, living the values of the city plan, and, uh, and making sure that uh, we are very clear and transparent in, in our, our decision making. That's the only way we're gonna embrace this change. That's the only way we're gonna make single steps, small steps in the restoring that trust if you feel that trust is, uh, uh, that did not exist in, the, in, in this, uh, this process, right? So, um, um, I hope that you will continue to embrace this change as we expect every community in Edmonton to embrace this change. Ever since, you know, I've been on the, in this position, uh, I want to be consistent because I have supported similar projects in, in other communities, right? So we just need to make sure being consistent, being persistent and living the values and making sure that communities understand that we all need to embrace this change. And we need to do that together by supporting each other. And so I hope you will continue. We, I hope you will understand the decision we're making today, and uh, and I will be supporting this uh, this uh, uh, bylaw. Okay. Uh, with that, I will take the chair back and go to Councillor uh, uh, Salvador to close. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to all the speakers who took the time to come out today and present. Um, you presented really clear and comprehensive arguments and I just wanna commend you for being so well prepared. So first I'll, I'll just address some of the assertions that this application is not in line with the city plan uh, and counter to draft district plans. I think colleagues spoke really well to that. Um, so I'll just build on it a little. And I think a lot of that tension is rooted in how we communicate expectations around the pace of growth and lo the location of growth. Um, I've come to realize that there is a necessary fuzziness or blurriness associated with the lines that we draw on maps. And it's oftentimes public hearings like this one where we get to work out that messiness and refer to the planning documents and direction that we do have. Uh, and I agree with my colleagues and Councillor Stevenson mentioned this, uh, when we look at city plan, to me, this is clearly in line with the vision outlined in that plan. I agree with administration's assessment that this site is in a transition area and that the scale and massing of the building is appropriate given this transitional context. It's on the edge of a major node where we would expect to see mid and higher rise developments. It's close to transit and it does offer a sensitive transition into the neighborhood. I was really pleased to see agreement uh, across the board that every neighborhood must be an active participant in the redevelopment and rebuilding of our city and that density is something we have to do together. Looking at Windsor Park, even if we factor in the last few years of development, we heard from administration that as a community, it's still below the density standards or expectations that we would wanna see in a new neighborhood. Um, and it's actually, it's interesting to me that it has remained this way for, for so long, given Windsor Park's proximity to, to the single largest educational institution on the prairies. Um, and when I look at the building itself, uh, the applicant has made efforts to step down the proposal uh, in height, as well as break up massing through the design. Uh, to me, this is the exact type of missing middle scale of project that we would expect to see and that we've been asking for. Uh, from, from the development community in the city of Edmonton. Um, then just turning to the unit typologies. Um, it, was, it was asserted that the unit typologies being proposed uh, are not necessarily going to contribute to the diversity of the neighborhood. And there was a desire for more three bedrooms and four bedrooms, which I think are absolutely important. Uh, but when I look at some of the data included in administration's report, um, I made note of a table which indicates 90% of the homes in Windsor Park are single detached. So requiring at least six three bedroom units, 50% or more two bedroom units and no more than 10% studio dwellings for this building, I think is actually a really positive step that will offer a diverse set of housing options and help rebalance the current housing stock that is dominated by single family homes. Um, and when I think about you know, who might live in this project, I can see yeah, absolutely being a good fit for students, but also for seniors who may wish to downsize and live in the community that they've loved for a really long time. Uh, maybe young families who might not be able to afford to buy a single family home in the community. And then I just wanna touch on inclusivity because I think that's a value that we all cherish, the city of Edmonton, and one that we aim to expand through our zoning and planning efforts. Um, though I understand that uh, some of the current residents might feel that you know this is a family-friendly community, uh, which I think it is. I worry that if if projects like this are are opposed, and when they offer a relatively more affordable form of housing, um, I think that places some of that inclusivity and diversity at risk. And to Councillor Hamilton's point, just because someone is not in a traditional family setup or renting more than one or two bedrooms they're still worthy of having housing choices in desirable neighborhoods like Windsor Park. Projects like this one should not be relegated to the exterior of a neighborhood to um, you know, buffer, buffer sound for the rest of the community. That's not equitable or inclusive. And I think that needs to be reflected in the planning decisions we make. Um, yeah, and I suspect that if this project does not move forward, this was alluded to before, uh, I, I suspect that the applicant would then be in an even more financially strenuous position. Uh, and regardless of whether they continue to advance this project or move on to other opportunities, uh, future property owners pursuing development at this site might be less thoughtful and more economically oriented in scope. Um, and I would anticipate a potentially conventional rezoning coming forward from this consolidated site uh, that might be seen as less beneficial or more intrusive by the community. So I think this is actually a really excellent way forward. Um, yeah.
Yeah, and then just to the point that was made earlier about the importance of ensuring that voices are heard, 100%. I absolutely agree. And I think it's important to remember that there are voices who are here in the room today um, that we've heard from who did an excellent job presenting. Um, there's also the voices who are not in the room who might not have been able to participate in today's discussion. There are the voices of the thousands of Edmontonians who gave their time and energy to develop the vision behind the city plan. And there are the voices of the future potential residents and families who might want to call this building home. So I'll be supporting this rezoning because it is in line with city plan. It will support housing choice and it will help us build a more fiscally and environmentally sustainable city in an area that's underdeveloped next to our city's largest major node. Thank you. Thank you, Council Salvador. So please vote. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried nine to three. Okay. Okay. Uh, we are. 3.2. 3.2 is the last. Sorry. We're still on the second reading, Mary. Oh, so what I'm talking about. Oh. oh. So easy. So fast. Okay, Councillor uh, Salvador, go ahead, please. I'll move second reading of Charter Bylaw 20384. Second by Councillor Tang. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Sorry, display the votes, please. That is carried. I'll move consideration of third reading of Charter Bylaw 20384. Okay. Councillor Tang? Second. Yep. Okay. Uh, please vote for consideration of third reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. So just hold on, hold on. My apologies, I thought I was voting on third. Can we recall, we recall the vote, the please? Recall the vote. Please vote for consideration of third reading. Just waiting on one vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll move third and final reading of Charter Bylaw 20384. Second. Okay, please vote for the final reading. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. All right, now we are back to 3.1, so no, 3.2. Uh, this was exempted by Councillor Rice, bylaw 20099, to close a portion of 156th Street, Southwest Chappelle. Councillor Rice, you have questions to administration, right? Uh, yes. Do you need a presentation? Oh, no, I don't. Okay, then, we, okay, just, just hold on then, hold on. Yeah. Uh, Okay, uh, any questions to uh, the proponent? Any questions to the proponent? No, no one is in opposition. Now, Councillor Rice, please, questions to the administration. Okay, I, I just have a few clarify questions. I, I was in Chapel area last Thursday and then saw the certain comments and from the neighborhood. So I just want to get a clarification. Uh, based on based on this bylaw, um, the proposal close portion is nearby. I want to open the map. Uh, so nearby the uh, RMD. Uh, so that is a portion here, but the uh, public park and is just nearby. Um, the question is right now and um, is right now we have any usage on this trail already, or this trail is not used at all? And for the residents to have that access. 
So uh, uh, AP and look at AP. AP just link to the, this uh, uh, rezone insight. Councillor Rice, if I understood correctly, yeah. uh, you are confirming if uh, currently any um, property takes access through this uh, uh, portion of road that is being closed? No, uh, it's about the usage for the park and on the map. Yeah. Councillor, is the question that is the trail yeah. built currently? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the trail isn't built currently. It's uh, currently government road allowance, the original uh, quarter section lines. As development proceeds, uh, the condition of subdivision, one of the conditions of subdivision uh, of the adjacent development will be to develop the trail network. Uh, so this cloth is, is just for the development of the trail? Correct. And then also for that development, and will benefit more green spaces and for the neighborhoods. Correct. It's part of the overall connectivity of the neighborhood. Um, and as it builds out, the, the network will be built out uh, in, in step. Uh, I, I do want to get clarified. And the closer, uh, closure is for build this trail to, ha to create that green spaces for the neighborhood. So just to clarify the, the closure, the purpose, yeah. yes, it is, uh, it serves dual purpose. The first is uh, uh, the total road right of is 20 meters. 10 meters of it will be uh, consolidated with adjacent properties and the remaining 10 meter will be developed for the greenway. So that's how, uh, does that clarify your um, I don't, let's reframe the question here. And the uh, were, uh, neighborhood residents just concerned about this closure. The purpose for the closure is to build that trail and then create the green spaces already existing there and uh, identified as AP, as a park area, and then increase access to the trail or is just uh, for the development for the RMD, if you look at the map. Yeah, we if we can bring the slide, uh, the last slide uh, yeah. on the screen, please. Yeah, if you see the uh, park is uh, on the s south uh, side of uh, the closure area, which is shown in red. So there is no, uh, nothing happening at the park itself. It is just the portion of the road uh, that is north of the park that is being closed and will be developed for the Greenway. Okay, and um, also on the reports, it says the uh, notice sent out. And however, by looking at the map, and there is no development happened, so that means zero notice and send it to any and homeowners around the area. I just want to get a last clarification as well. And because nobody will receive the notice because this is just an empty area. Thank you for your question, Councillor. Um, I believe notices were sent out to um, property owners within a 60 meter radius of the road closure area. So the properties to the east in Cook Lane would have received notices as well as the AG parcel to the west. So that means there's a Cook Line Southwest yes. in that area? Yes. Okay, the that area right now, if you look at the, if we close this road, is there have the access to this park area as well? Do they have, ac currently do they have access to that park area? Yes, they do. And um, if we can go to the slide that shows the NSP and, and the city plan slide. So the road closure area is shown in red and the multi-use trail and the greenways is shown in that black dash line. The intention of the NSP is to create that network for active modes travel and the road closure area will still remain as right of way but will be converted to greenways and the multi-use trail as envisioned by the NSP. Okay. Okay, that's all my question. So I can move across today. Yeah, just hold on. Yeah. Uh, so that concludes the questions uh, to administration. At this time, I will ask if uh, 
council members have any questions to administration or to the proponent uh, or of uh, any new information arising out of the previous questions. Seeing none, now I'll go to Councillor Rice to close the public hearing. I move that the bylaw 2099 and be closed for the public hearing. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Prince Bay. Okay, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. waiting on one vote yes thank you councillor hamilton we have all the votes display the votes please that is carried i move that by law 20099 for the first reading okay second second by constant principal please vote Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move that bylaw 20099 for second reading. Second. Thank you, Councillor Principal. Please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move the bylaw 20099 for the consideration of this third reading. Second. Second. Please vote. Consideration for third reading. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I move that by law 2099 for the final reading of third reading. Okay. Second. Thank you. Please vote for the final reading. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Do, 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 do. Okay, notices of motions are motions without customary notice. Seeing none, we are adjourned at 435.